You are now entering Maximum Driftcast, the only drifting podcast hosted by a Spanish soccer mom, a 30-year-old silverhead fox We're going right on 60, one. and finally, a 200-pound bowl of spaghetti oh God, with chimichanga no arms. Here we are, since right now. We are the champions. playing music. No watch pop is going to bring us in. Here we go. Konnichiwa, yokoso maximu dorifuta kasto. Watashi wa Paco san. Eh, kori. Hi. <laughs> what was that, Paco? We, 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 did you work on that greeting for quite some time? Yeah, you have been working for like the last three minutes. Man, that's that's <laughs> great. I was going to ask Ken. Actually, now that we have the man here, I'm, we got to come up with a you know the champ. Um, we can call him the People's Champ. We can call him uh, Mr. Arigato, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> Cordy, stop it. Him, uh, <laughs> look at this guy. This guy has been sitting in his car in a parking lot with his garage Dude, closed. He's been sitting in his car since last For week. the past hour. He, look at how sweaty spaghetti he is. The dude still is a stud. Before he entered Formula Drift competition, he didn't wear glasses. But after the last round of winning, the champagne that sprayed in his face blinded him temporarily. And now he has glasses. Ken, tell us more about the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a I have really bad eyesight, and I found this out when I was in the fifth grade. And it, my teacher called my parents and told my mom, "Hey, I think your son needs to get his eyes checked because he keeps going like this." Oh, <laughs> out of class. So uh, yeah, I've been wearing glasses since I was ten years old. But uh, during competition, I'm in contacts. So mm -hmm. you guys don't get to see this nerdy side of me. No, do you know what the nerdy side of you is? Uh, something that is very beautiful looking. I'm glad we get to capture you when you get to put your hair up. You know, usually you put your hair down, but your hair doesn't stay down. It goes up. <laughs> so when you see your hair go up, it's a, it's a great, great sight. Usually when you take your helmet off, we usually think your helmet's still on because your hair is just perfectly round like a helmet. Mm. Um, but uh, we got to, guys, chat, everybody. Ken Gushi, the man... The the youngster, the dude who got in the Formula D when he was just a baby in diapers. <laughs> <sighs> My heart is fluttering. I'm blushing. Yeah. Ken, how, how you doing, buddy? You look you look really good right now. You're you're refreshed. Yeah, I've been well. Obviously, uh, you know, coming off of the weekend with a really great res result, um, really helps me sleep at night. Yeah. Dude. So it sounds like you have a, another companion sleeping next to you now, and it's in the shape of a carbon fiber uh, trophy or something. Is that thing sleeping with you now, or what? Uh, yeah, it has been it has been staring at me gloriously through the night, but uh, it's still so surreal to be able to hold that winning trophy. And you know, sometimes I have to pinch myself <laughs> to see if it actually happened. Mm -hmm. oh, like like a lot of people, a lot of people didn't don't know, but. Um... I guess I mean, and I want I, I I want to be as correct as possible, but it's been since 2005. Last time you were first on a podium. That's correct. Um, that's a very very sad st statistic. But Ugh, yeah, sad. the last time I was on top of the box was in 2005 when I was uh, driving for a different manufacturer, Ford Racing, and a Mustang. But then, um, but I mean, but after that, you had several sexes and thirds. Is that correct? Yeah, I've had yeah. multiple podiums uh, with a huge, successful uh, season in 2015 where we came off with four podiums um, and then two podiums in 2016, I believe. Yep. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I remember, I remember. My first win since 2005. I remember Jerry Can making such a big deal out of it. It was a little bit like, dude, okay, we get it. <laughs> but it was good. Like, I mean, like, it's just kind of like. I think it's a big deal because you are probably one of the people who started um, drifting in the states and like popularized it. And I mean, you're not one. Of the, you're one of the reasons why people like me and probably I'm going to speak for Brian, but you know, like we're guys that followed this thing. It's like, oh, that's Ken Gushi. Like that's like, you know, like the guy to watch. And he, you, you know, you were coming to events and taking photos with with people and. Like you were kind of like one of the first faces to become popular and, and approachable, you know what I'm saying? Mm, yeah, no, well, I really appreciate that. But that just really says a lot about uh, 
how long I've been in the sport. And yeah. uh, like you said, I'm one of the actually mm-hmm. three of us now that have has not missed a single event. It's uh, Chris Forsberg, oh. Dayo Shihara, and myself. And I would include Von Gitten, but he actually missed an Irwindale event after a huge crash in, uh, Texas, in Texas years ago. So, yeah, it's uh, just the three of us that's been in it since day one. Hasn't missed a single event. But with that said, I'm the only one out of uh, the three or four of us that hasn't had a championship yet. So I still, I'm still, i still yet to fulfill that part of uh, my career. Got really close in 2015, but yeah. I, you know, I've been, you know, ever since your win in an Irwindale, Ken, I've been doing a lot of research on you. Okay. Um, one of the things I researched is your level 40 in Pokemon Go. Yes. Your Bulbasaur <laughs> is a monster. You, um, one master. You, your glasses prescription can light ants on fire with the proper angle of sunlight. Um, I, don't know, I don't know. Are you sure about that? <laughs> are you trying? Only, are you trying to say? <laughs> are you trying to say that you you wanted to be the very best, the best okay, that I, ever the yeah. best that ever was? And I've become the very best. If you guys take a look at my Pokemon collection, <laughs> look at this. Dude, just Holy stack. That dude's stack, guys. Like, guys, he's taking. Fuck. Please. It's so all the fun. nerds, all the nerds watching and listening right like, now are probably wanting to blow up your DMs. Um, yep. Crazy. So just guys, don't please, please, all you Pokemon guys, please don't blow up Ken. He's a very busy man. He's go, probably going to go on the Ellen Generous show for winning <laughs> Irwindale. I have uh, a level. Uh, what I don't know what level this is, but it's a shiny Mewtwo. That's oh. a. <sighs> look at that, guys. This is incredible. Hey, this is. Hey, you guys hey, notice this is, the green part on Mewtwo yeah. is actually interacting with the green screen. Look at that, yep, guys. At that. This is absolutely. <laughs> this is this is so journalism crazy. at its finest, guys. We want to welcome you guys. Welcome you guys to Maximum Pokemon Cast. Ken here, world traveler. He's also a former drift competitor, but his Pokemon is stacked. He has some of the most incredible Pokemon. It's a. Um, it's called a. It's just, called a Pokedex, just Corey. You guys, just to prove it to you guys, look. Level forty. He oh, can't shit. go any higher than that. Wow. And that's that's you right there, that's wearing it. a very cute hat. One more, one more thing, one more thing I have to prove. So July set. Oh no, sorry. July sixth, twenty sixteen was the exact date that Pokemon Go was launched on the App Store, and that shows the date that I started. What does that say? July sixth, twenty sixteen. <laughs> so you've been three years strong. Wow, love dropping in the Mewtwo. Hold on, uh, Miss, Mr. Jack says I love <laughs> dropping in a Mewtwo on the screen. Gucci gang, dude, Ken, you have many fans that support all your bad habits, including Pokemon um, and drifting. But you know, for, for everybody that's tuning in right now, obviously we know Ken Gucci as this guy that has perfect abs and he drives a Toyota GT86. Uh, he does wear contacts in his race, and I'll let the glasses sexy fool you. But here's some accolades from Ken Gushi. Ken reached number one qualifying, but lost in top 16 tandems in 2004 Formula Drift Championship, the very first round of Road Atlanta. After a few weeks, Ken Shiro won $10,000 winner-takes-all international drag shootout at Road and Track U.S. Sport Compact. You know, I've never, Ken, I've never received that $10,000. I don't know where it went. You spent it on <laughs> Pokemon Go stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, in 2007, following his father's dream, Ken took the challenge of the race at Pikes Peak Hill Climb. So in 2007, you, you drove Pikes Peak. Incredible. I did. 10, There's 000, more 2000. to that story. There's all right, more hold on. Story. Okay, we're going to dig in. I'm just, I'm just, let me, I'm, I'm hyping you right now, dude. Let me be your hype man for two seconds, all right? You don't need it because you just came off a winner. Window, but let me hype you real quick. Okay, 2008, Ken was picked up by Scion Racing in the RSR to pilot the first ever real drive converted Scion TC, dude. 2008, 2009, Ken so got second place at Sonoma. So that Qualifying, was that was right? Gucci's fault then. The very first rear wheel drive yep. conversion car, that was Ken Gucci. Yep. It's your fault, dude. Yep. <laughs> and 2011. Well, hey, is that a, is, yeah. Is that a is that a fault? <laughs> Did I start a bad trend? <laughs> nah. I mean, nah, I'm just I'm just being obviously I'm being an asshole. Like out of I I out of everybody probably I love I love uh, rear wheel drive conversion cars more than everybody, but um. Dude, like you've been, you've had your hands on everything. Corey, keep going with the stats. Nope, I'm done because we have um, HMRSR81 and Chad is saying, Kenshiro doesn't need a hype man, Snorlax. So I wonder if Snorlax <laughs> um, is a bad thing or a good thing, but I'll take it because hopefully uh, if I am a Snorlax, I can end up in Gucci's Pokemon collection so he can look at me every night before he goes plays. You know what? I'll name you, I'll name my strongest Snorlax after you, Corey. How's that? Aww. I. That would be such a sweet, sweet, sweet moment. Yeah. 
But uh, anyways, Pokemon chat. Um, <laughs> let's get that out of the way. Ken, you're, you're coming off, I want to say, an incredible season. I say it's an incredible season because you're obviously ending up on a win. Um, a lot of big changes has happened for you this year mm -hmm. um, internally in the team. And we saw a lot of uh, discussions happen at the end of last year of you almost going back to uh, almost being a private tier, but you you kind of did a lot more than just drive this year. You, you had a lot on your plate. That's um, right. So, and I think that's what adds to this unique and crazy story of you finally capturing a win. But to kind of break down this year for us and how this year was different than other years and your role as in the team, not only just a driver, but everything that you've been doing. It, it, this is the stuff that just makes that win and everything that led up so special. Yeah, I mean, holy cow, I'm, I'm getting the chills just thinking about it. But towards yeah. the middle of 2018, uh, Kenji, who's the president of Grady Performance, and I kind of sat down and had a conversation of uh, me possibly taking over the entire motorsports program at Grady Racing, uh, which included, obviously, my uh, drift program. Um, and part of the reason we had that conversation was because he kind of wanted to focus on the business aspect and... Uh, give me the opportunity to kind of become a team owner, team manager, and, and obviously team driver. Um, at the time, you know, I was kind of overwhelmed with how much responsibility would come with that. Uh, but I said, yeah, why not? I think if I can pull this off, I should be able to, um, to run any business. So I said, yeah. and at the beginning of 2019, I had announced that I became a team owner under Kangushi Motorsports, and so I took on the challenge and task of uh, planning what was ahead or what was to come for the full season, and that included obviously managing the team, uh, logistics of the race car, uh, buying another trailer, and um, you know preparing everything that had to happen before the season opener in Long Beach. So I kind of scrambled with a lot of it because I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to approach my sponsors as a team owner um, because I had been doing everything as a just a, just a driver. So a more of that kind of felt overwhelming. And the most challenging part was actually juggling all that while trying to focus on uh, performing at my absolute best at these events. Mm -hmm. So um, to be honest with you, before Long Beach, I was so nervous. I was hella anxious yep. um there were there were many nights where i would go to sleep asking if i had made the right choice uh, and of course you know there were nights where i didn't get much sleep because i was so nervous stressed out um but once long beach came it it didn't really feel as overwhelming because my team sort of helped me along the way and they really took off a lot of the stress that i was kind of um carrying upon myself where I could have just easily relieved all that by sharing my concerns with them. Um, but, but yeah, that was kind of like the biggest challenge was just taking on the whole program and, um, you know, feeling all the, the pressure, the stress and overcoming a lot of the challenges. And part of the challenge was also managing the funding that would allow me to participate in formula drift. No pressure. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, and like for most people that don't know, it's like some of the strongest battles is dealing and providing deliverables for the sponsor. So it's like, yes, you're expected right. to go out to compete, but after each round, we need photos. We need our marketing pack. We need a bio rota. We need a breakdown of the event. We need you to do a guest appearance. We need to do a drive and drive at Texas Motor Speedway. We need you to da da And so it's like now this old Kangushi of just showing up and driving has now turned into a team owner, essentially. And so now you're booking, managing all the logistics, finding a way to get the crew out there. Then you're hustling sponsorships to keep the team funding and going. Right. Uh, and then after once all that's going, then it's, okay, now I can finally drive. And then if something happens, now I got to fix it. And then I get to drive. It's uh, So you know how it is, Corey. That's exactly it. And you've been there. You've done that. Have you seen how it goes when, you know, the engine blows, um, that comes out of your pocket? You know, you got to yeah. find the time to even fix it. You got to find the time to fly your crew out to swap the engine in between rounds. Um, it's it's overwhelming. 
Well, it's um, you know, you you go back through the years here. I'm gonna pull up a little uh, a little chart here as we were just d- we're digging deep into the Gucci statistics as um we go back uh, through the years, and this year you've had some obviously really really high moments, and you had some moments where it's like shit, you know, it takes the wind out of you. And sometimes it's like I don't know if you've ever been in a position. I hope you weren't, but it's like you know being in a position where. It's like, man, did I make the right decision coming back this year? You know, everything seems like it's against you. You're doing so much now. But have you ever had a moment where you're kind of like a little overwhelmed with everything that has been been happening now that you're taking this new role? Um, I guess the the most stressful part was if I was even able to afford the whole season, having, right. having been committed to a full season of Formula Shift with obviously my sponsor obligations, yep. um, a lot of my partners – and the media in general. So kind of breaking down the budget to be able to pull off the whole season without going under was one of my biggest concerns going into the season. But once it started, you know, my team members really, really helped kind of relieve some of that, some of those challenges and concerns by uh, helping out, by, you know, helping me choose which way would be the the cheaper alternative to um, make, make stuff happen essentially. Um, but like you said, there were a lot of roadblocks. I think the biggest roadblock would have to be towards the end of the season and yeah. St. Louis when, uh, we lost an engine and we can talk about that later, but it was a brand new engine. Uh, we had spent a lot of money and time to get that engine package into the car. I was super excited and I completely just messed up, shared the oil cooler and, uh, spilled oil all over the track, ruined it for everyone. And uh, yeah, I was very sad did um and that's the thing is you're obviously running a 2jz power plant which you've been running the past few years and uh obviously the incident did that incident it obviously wiped out the oil cooler but that did that take out the motor it did so that was uh i was very excited for that engine because it was my it's my first year working with ocd um and they built my head uh right. and then of course my engine builder blue moon performance and our partner super tech and bc uh, we had a new VVTI engine going in. So the engine that I lost at St. Louis was that engine, the VVTI head. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we completely, or I completely lost it because I had crashed into Kazia, who was running in front of me, uh, sheared off the top of the oil cooler. And I didn't know that I was just dumping oil all over the track, but I happened to stay on full throttle for eight full seconds. Uh, towards the latter half of the course, lost oil pressure and uh, yeah, and the engine went boom. And so you you weren't able to dig in for a backup, or did OCD build you uh, a second engine? No, we uh, ended up kind of re- reverting back to our good faithful non VVTI uh, three liter two uh, JZ that we used until the event before that, essentially. See, yeah. but, we, but we bust out a uh, old trusty over there and threw her in and, and sent it. Yeah, and guess what? So that's the same what? engine that I actually kept in the car after that incident and managed to win Irwindale. So good old faithful really didn't let me down at all this season. That's incredible. So let's. I'm looking at your stats. So let's go back from the beginning of the year. Obviously, coming back, team owner, driver of the Gretty Racing Toyota GT86. So uh, top 32, you went against Matt Kaufman. Okay, you've been advanced against Matt Coffin, and then you met Matt Field, where Matt Field beat you. So you made top 16 mm-hmm. in Long Beach, which, uh, you know, going Coffin was super strong in Long Beach. You did extremely well, and you ended up surpassing him and going against Field. Field came out with the Corvette. Um, not a bad way to start the season. And did you feel Long Beach was, uh, even though you made top 16, were you feeling pretty comfortable at that point? I was. So I made uh, some suspension changes in the off season, but that was it. So I didn't really think that we had made too big of a change going into you know the new season. But uh, losing to Matt Field wasn't all that bad because he had qualified first and he was right. literally on fire. He was you know on a good one, and so I knew it was going to be a big challenge to take him out. But I was just happy that the changes that we made during the off season just worked. That was. Kind of my concern going into Long Beach, aside from the fact that I had taken over uh, the team role or the team owner role. Uh, right. But for driving, yeah, that was one of my biggest concerns, and it seemed to work. So I was 
pretty pumped that uh, we had even managed to beat Kaufman in the top 32. So even like going through, so obviously you have Long Beach, you, you broke into the top 16 in uh, Orlando. Once again, you broke into the top 16 by beating Jonathan Castro, where I believe he he had a big incident coming off the bank, spun out or something like that. But you had an immaculate chase run, and then you go to the third round of Atlanta, which that was your first time going out in top 32. Yeah, so that, that was a controversial. Contra- yeah. Controversial. How do you say that? Controversial? How, how do you say it in Japanese? <laughs> Controversial. Contro- <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So Atlanta, we were uh, against. Sorry, mosquito. We were against uh, gotcha. Von Gen Jr. Yep. And that was the battle where he had spun out in front of me, crossing the finish line, and you know, <sighs> we had protested. Oh, no, no, we were going to protest, but I was told. You know, save your money. Don't protest because the judges are not going to overturn it. <sighs> so we had lost it. But then uh, in between rounds, I had went online and I said a lot of bad things about, you know, the judging, <laughs> uh, which I still apologize and I feel bad till this day. But I didn't really know where to voice my concerns because I was told, you know, it wouldn't be worth protesting. Mm-hmm. So obviously I, I, wanted to fe- I wanted to hear the feedback online. And so I reached out to some of the judges, uh, first of all, apologizing for my ranting and then asking for an explanation and how I felt like it was kind of against our favor in that the round before that, we were told it's not okay to spin in the direction of the drift, but if you cross the finish line and you spin in the other direction, it would be okay. However, in Atlanta... Vaughn Vaughn spun in the same direction of the corner crossing the finish line and he in fact went into the wall it was an isolated incident I didn't touch him and I crossed the finish line and completed the course so I just felt like I was kind of cheated and so after that uh, we had a vote and they came up with a new rule saying that you cannot spin anywhere near the finish line well it seems it seems like that was a rule that was added because it like I, I guess um, before the line everything's like oh as long as it's inside the line everything's fine if you may get past the line everything's cool doesn't matter but I, I guess like since the sport is still evolving especially when it comes like to the judging that's one of the one of the things that we're like well you know what we definitely need to make a change here because there's a lot of drivers who are voicing um, a concern <coughs> about that and and I think and I think you guys are right I mean I'm glad. Uh, I mean, F Formal Drift did the change because you guys voiced it, and I mean, I guess everybody agrees that that shouldn't be. Well, you know, right? let's um, let's talk about that because yeah. th- this has been happening for years. It's been happening for the past 15 years of sometimes people spinning across the finish line, even in qualifying, and still scoring points. Your boy Do- Dai Yoshihara suffered from the new rule this he past did. weekend at Irwindell. The judges said. Die would have had a 97 or 98, 98 point qualifying run if he didn't have spin out. But since he crossed the finish line and then spun out, his qualifying lap was still considered a zero. So right. Die could have been a top qualifier, but since the rule from Atlanta that was implemented because of the Gucci Vaughn incident has now changed, oh, raise the roof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're back in the 90s again. We're just lifting this massive Toyota roof. Um, <laughs> Um, the rules have changed, and it hurt Dai Yoshihara this weekend. But prior to that, I would have walked away with a 98. But the idea, maybe you can elaborate on the idea, and you've talked about already a little bit, is even if you spin out after the finish line, that's still almost considered an unchaseable run because if an incident were to happen where it would damage another person's car, that could sacrifice a lot more not only for the show but for the drivers in it. So what was the um, what was the big complaint behind the spin on after the line? Like what what was the triggering effect? Well, my, so in my point of view, we're all yes. professional drivers, right? Like yeah. we shouldn't be. You, I'm mean pop or not? We're 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 shitty journalists, but yes, you're a professional <laughs> driver. Okay, fine. Okay, the guys that are competing in Formula Drift <laughs> are professional drivers. You yep. were once a part of us, so that makes you a professional driver. Oh, but thanks, Ken. with that said. Professional drivers should not be spinning anywhere near the track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whether it's before the finish line, after the finish line, whatever. I just think it looks 
bad. Um, you know, a spin is a spin. I think you should just maintain a proper drift in control. So, so basically show control of your drift uh, well past the finish line. And you can do yeah. a celebratory dinner, di- dinner. I mean, donuts somewhere mm-hmm. else. Just just keep it away from, you know, the main course, especially during a tandem battle where you're, right. uh, like you said, where it could possibly cause a collision. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um like for example, like after you cross the line and you obviously regain control, yeah. If after that you want to do celebratory donuts, that's a good show. Um, but I think I think uh, like fans and drivers just need to kind of like understand that there's a point for celebrating. There's a time for celebrating. There's a time for qualifying. There's a time for competing. And I mean, some of the things that happen. Uh, as well at Arundel this weekend. I mean, which we'll 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 have an, a special episode just to talk about all those things. But uh, um, so this is just like the the crossing the line issue, uh, spinning with uh, the the line. Is there any other laws? Or, I mean, laws rules that you have uh, also addressed or been part of the making the change? Oh my God! I feel like I was part of a few controversial happenings this year um so that was definitely one of them too sexy for the paddock doesn't count (sighs) that was in the apps days Cordy's like Uh, gone i'm listening (laughs) i'm listening i'm listening to your questions paco what was it was it was it hold on let me think okay so that was one uh oh, oh 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 so um I don't know if it was just me, but a lot of drivers had complained about, you know, basically as a chase chase driver, where are you allowed to initiate? You know, because some of us like to initiate side by side. Yeah. But this year they had implemented a rule where the chase driver has to initiate behind the lead driver. You can be offset parallel like this, but your nose has to be behind the lead car. So... You know, we can't do an initiation side by side like this going going uh, into the initiation. We cannot impede the lead car's lane. Um, now, that opens up a lot of doors for the lead car, especially on a track like New Jersey, where the run-up is so short. Um, the lead car can immediately drop into the chase car's lane, impeding the chase car's opportunity to gain or maintain speed to stay in proximity with the lead car. And I feel like that was kind of a bad call on the rule, not necessarily on the judges or their organization, but just in that specific round where the run-up is so short, it was a bad way to implement that rule because Mm -hmm. now the lead car or the chase car is at a disadvantage to maintain the proper pace. You guys get what I'm saying or am I just talking? Yeah, no, 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 because like here's the thing is like – and we look at this a lot of the some of the best tandem battles especially throughout earlier the year is when you initiate with that lead driver right. and honestly in the chase position if you initiate at the same position let me get my hands in position here um behind lean follow it's more difficult to settle in and get into that pocket because you're positioning yourself you're gonna have to play mild game of catch up to position yourself in that pocket but i think we had an incident where we had somebody cross initiate and take out the front of another person's car. And I think that, who was that that got hit this year with that uh, aggressivist initiation? It was uh, Castro and Dean Kearney. I believe that was it, where we had impact on that. Oh, and so, so, yeah, that was this past weekend, right? Um, It may have happened again this weekend. Yeah, that was but, this weekend. It was in top 32. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was, there was, it's been happening a few times. I just think it's one of those things where drivers have to watch their lanes. I thought the lane separation that you guys had was good enough, you know, giving somebody a fault if they cross into the chase driver's lane. Um, I don't know. Whatever puts on the better show, I think, is um, what is what's required. But you've been doing this for 15 years. Have you ever had an issue before initiating with somebody? Uh, not, you know not what really. I mean? I don't think uh, so. Uh, and I oh. and it goes back to your, 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 your statement of saying you're all professional drivers, right? right. So it's like why not we do what we've been doing for the past 15 years and just continue to initiate? Just don't be an asshole and crash into me. 
you know, you stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane until it comes time to do business. So I don't know. It's very interesting. I, I do I do get the whole spin out at the finish line because that's where a lot of dudes have had close or near issues of totaling and damaging cars by having a little mistake at the end of the track. But yeah. I think – Can I – Go ahead, Ken. Um, no, you're, you're – can I ask you a quick question? Wow. Sorry. Yeah. I can't help but notice, but is is this what people are seeing? So is my screen like that tiny? No, you are. Um, Am I big? No, no, no. You are on you. We are live on YouTube. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're big. Yeah, you're, I didn't want to be like doing hand signs <laughs> off the screen. No, you're, you're fine. You're a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so going back to your question, I the only one time that I had an incident was where uh, there there was still a rule where the lead car had to stay in the lead lane. Right. Um, but then I was. Side, door to door in my own lane yep. and Chris Stapps had dropped into my lane and uh, impeded my initiation uh, and they called his fault. They called a fault on him. Now, I just feel like if there's too many rules, it kind of holds us... I don't know if, if, I, if I can nah. describe this the, the best way, but... I'll help you describe it, but go okay. ahead. Okay, so let me try my best to explain okay. what I'm feeling. Because I wanted to sometimes, say the same thing. Right. Sometimes yep. it's better not to have a rule and let us do what we know how to do best, I guess. And it'll make for a cleaner initiation, cleaner run. Um, I don't know. I just feel like too many I'll, rules kind of impedes. I'll help you translate it then okay, because yeah. I, this is – so let's go back to 2012 and 2013. We talk about this year very often because that was the year where we had speed rules. We had if a cone's knocked over, that's a zero. If you drop two tires, that's an automatic zero. They were very specific on the initiation, and they created such a very defined rule on how you should be getting around the racetrack that it took away a lot of the spirit of drifting and a lot of the uh, the organic uh, driving style that a lot of these drivers had because there were so many rules that – it forced everybody to be this very precise robotic driver that reduced, you know, their flair, their characteristic, their driving style because the judges were so specific on what they wanted to see. And so the more rules you have, it actually limits drivers to drive creativity as creative as they want, initiate how they want. When if you have a more kind of open system, it lets drivers do what they feel is best, which could be um, something that fits their driving style more. But it's like the less rules opens up for more opportunity to create a better driving experience, not only for the drivers, but also put on a better show for the fans by limiting the control of some things that do, are happening on track. If that So, yeah, that works if there's no incidents, right? But when we right. do happen to have an incident, that's where you know these rules come in like, well, there was this rule. So... If you were to ask me, well, how do we fix it then? Like, I, I honestly don't know. I, I don't know how we can fix this. Um, you know, this initiation rule, lead car, lead lane, chase car, yada, yada. There's just rules are there to protect us when shit hits the fan. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, that's, and that's the other thing, too, is that uh, for being around for only about 15, 16 years, there's still shit hitting the fan that's never hit this fan before. And so they're still reacting to, you know, it's like, how could you go for 16 years? And then finally in the 15th or 16th year, you say, all right, guys, now we're going to be putting in a rule that you can't spin out after the finish line, even though for the past 15 years, we're cool with it. But right. it goes back to, now it's changing because we're still adapting and we're still making these changes yeah, and the absolutely. cars are getting faster. Dude, you guys were driving like fucking nutcases. You guys were so fast around Irwindale. Like, the yeah. rules are still adapting to what you guys are building and driving. You know what I mean? You obviously were in the first Formula Drift. Can you imagine trying to have that car compete in modern day Formula D? Oh my God, I would have whooped everyone's ass the first ten years. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um, yeah. It's, so I think what we're running into is still adapting rules to what we're driving or what we're competing in, right? You know, it's, no, you're absolutely right. And so it's like, yes, it's kind of like one of those things that. Uh, I mean, I it's think, shocking that rules are still being changed, but it, you, you got to look at everything else that's changing with the sport. But also, the, the, other, time. the other thing about the rules is that when it comes to a competition and when it comes to people pouring, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on the racing programs, there has to be an objective way 
of judging and deciding who gets the win. You know, it can't it can't be just judged based on like the guy who was watching said, oh, "I like that better," and that's the guy who wins. So, in you know, like when it comes to the competition aspect, like there's obviously a, like a lot of nitty gritty parts of the rules that need to be um, written and explained, and there's no time to explain them all. But I think there's definitely a bunch of rules that that they definitely need to exist when it comes to competition, and that those are like the the rules that need to be perfectly explained for the fans because it seems like it's the fans mostly who have the biggest um, disconnect of what's going on between what's going on in the in, in track with the judges, and in some cases even some of the some of the drivers are like like clueless like what I I won how. Or what? Like we're going one more time. I thought I lost already. So, which we saw this weekend. So, sure. No, I agree. And you know, to the judges' defense, I think they're doing a fantastic job. Um, you know, doing Except their job. Except Andy Yang, because Andy ain't quit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll talk about that. We'll. Talk, I love Andy, but we'll talk about that. Yeah, I mean, and the reason why sometimes these calls take forever to you know determine a winner is because, like you said, they're aware that we are there spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, being a part of the series. And, you know, it's not, it's not easy spending so much time, money being at these tracks only to be shafted by the judges. And they're, they're very well aware of that. So, you know, it's, it's not just on us as drivers to take on the challenge of, you know, making the sport better as far as the judging goes, but the judges themselves are doing a really hard job Mm -hmm. making sure that, Drifting as a sport continues to evolve and becomes more and more accepted by the general public that's watching Formula Drift or competitive drifting in general, because you know it's not fun spending thousands of dollars to be there on a weekend only to get you know taken out in the first battle because of unfair judging. Like they're they're very very well aware of that. Formula Drift is aware of that. They're very yeah. on top of it. And you know, like you said, this sport is still new. Uh, it continues to evolve. Hell, even our cars continue to evolve. Mm-hmm. Every yeah. year it gets faster. It gets, you know, we come in with more grip, more power, closer tandem battles. So as we evolve as drivers, the series also evolves as their uh, judging criteria, the new rules that are implemented, some that we agree with, some that we don't. Um, but it's only there to make the sport better and to help us in case, like I said earlier, right. shit hits the fan. Which, watch uh, watch your language, young man. Here. Um, before before we move on real quick, there's we have a lot of super chat questions, which, by That's the way, it, um, if you're listening and you're watching on YouTube right now, you can send us a super chat question by throwing us a couple bucks like the cheap whores that we are. You know, you get we, we'll ask your question. <laughs> and uh, the first one we have right here is from R.R. Lopez is saying, Ken Shiro and Cody should team up and call their team 2JUC Hot Dogs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> laughing is, is is perfect. Okay. It's a perfect answer for that. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, let's let, no. Let's see. Ken, would you? Would you? Would I ever what? have the privilege one day to be your teammate? Maybe one day. Are we going to be called the Two Jz Hot Dogs? I mean, okay. Two Juicy the, Hot the Dogs. The Two Juicy you're, Hot well, you're, Dogs. Hot dogs. You're oh, the juice. Because the juicy. Ju- yeah, because you're the juice, and I'm the, the fucking juice. Loose. Loose. I get it. Yes, I love hot dogs. I know. You, do you remember when uh, you were a baby and I made you a few when you were a little tiny baby? I, I do remember when you grilled the <laughs> buns the, the wrong way. Uh, wrong way. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. terrible. Sorry about that. That's all good, man. Yeah, two juicy hot dogs. Um, Tino, I've only driven with Ken a handful of times, but I would love to come out and party with them. At, hey, like, we've, we've done grid life together. Yeah, we so have. That's amazing right. Amazing events. You Dude, know, such good times. Together. Yeah. Such incredible time. Did you that, ever, that's what I missed the most. Did you ever battle Corey? Or went like at least door to door with him? I'll, at tell you, no, I'll tell you the one, one event we battled. We were actually rode in Atlanta and uh, we were gritting up and we battled for a porta potty because Ken <laughs> had to do number two and I did number one. And I said, so, one always goes first. Let's just so, go all together at the same time and do a number yeah. three. So we, uh, we we battled. That was our closest battle we've had. Actually, Ken and I both lost because we spun out before we entered the porta potty. <laughs> Living skid marks everywhere. Yeah. We, we, we both lost. Yeah. Thanks, R.R. Uh, Lopez. <laughs> thanks, R.R. Lopez. You're the man. 
Uh, uh, what else we got, Pop? I have another one from our buddy, Brooks Church. Brookie. Oh, what an animal. Ooh, I love that guy. Hey, I what's up, Brooks. Brookie? Rowdy. Yeah. Rowdy in the build. The Rowdy, the Mr. Rowdy himself. High fives to everyone from Atlanta. Gushy, congratulations. You effing rock. No one else deserves a win more than you. Sam FD Judge 2020. Wow. No. Thank you, Brooks. That means yeah, a lot. Brooks. Brooks is a OG, OG, almost a day number one from Atlanta. Shout out to Brooks. Sam is the FD judge. I wouldn't wish that upon anybody because nobody wants to hear Sam's nasally voice. Well, he doesn't have to be. He doesn't have to be Ryan uh, Ryan Lantain. He oh, can yeah, just he be in Indiana where he sits behind and draws and yeah. uses uh, the etcher sketch to type yeah. in his score. Get mad at everybody and just like ah, yeah. I want King King Gucci to win because. Eh. All right, what else? We got one more or two more? And then yeah, we can have get one, back one more uh, from Ben right. Tranter. Corey, okay. Ooh. you should come back to Pro 2 and drive for Huddy. Maybe he can actually keep it together Ooh. for rounds. <laughs> let's talk about Huddy. Ben, yeah, let's talk about Huddy because I'm obviously not anywhere near part of that. But Oh, you're not part of it? Just, oh, man, I was the one funding the project. Right. But you know, well, well, like Before we talk about Huddy, let me get warmed up here real quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's talk about that here. Sorry, I just had to do a big nitrous express whip it. Talk about Eddie. Good job. Jesus Christ. Whew. I so, just feel so bad for Dylan. You know, I don't know what happened, but I just we're gonna have we're we're gonna have a special a special uh, episode to address the whole Huddy situation. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but, um, what we could talk about it was. Um, I mean, we can say yeah. that 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 Dylan obviously he couldn't make it to Formula Drift this weekend. He had no car. Huddy was nowhere to be found, and uh, car never showed up. Magically, no? during the off or during the two rounds, the car ended up blowing a motor, which the car was never run. So we got to figure out how the motor blew up. We got to figure out how to get tra uh, Dylan's transmission out or why it's even in there. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, and you had three drivers prior to this that had very similar issues. Drivers and, uh, and, and also uh, business operators. Pat Gooden, Alec Honadel, uh who else? Uh, Turk. Mm, Turk. You had you, you had multiple guys who've had very similar issues, and believe it or not, Ken, we actually got some backlash from some of the fans saying, "Well, why didn't you?" Prepare and tell Dylan oh, yeah. that other drivers got fucked by Huddy. Yeah, it, it was and our fault. Like we 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 did it for him. You dude, know? we got we got we got ripped <laughs> a little bit on that, and it's okay because when we did the episode with Dylan, when he originally announced that he was going to be on Huddy, we were congratulating him. And let me tell you guys why we were congratulating him. It's because when somebody gives you an opportunity to leave the, live this dream, and you know the circumstances, even if it's dancing with the devil a little bit, you got to support them and congratulate them because hopefully, yeah. For sure, they 100%. don't they don't go down that path, and you're hoping the best for Dylan, and you're hoping that something has changed, yeah. and you know Dylan has a good head on his shoulders. You know Dylan's one of the best car builders actually in the paddock next to Forsberg, so it's like there was a lot of odds in his favor. So rather than saying "Yo, dude, heads up for Harry because he's been a fucking asshole to everybody else," it's like "Yo, dude, you know, good luck, go get it." Yeah, but um, but also Corey, but that's what we said publicly. I mean, obviously there's yes. stuff that we didn't. We didn't air, and you know he knew. That's the other thing. Like he knows. He knew then that was you know people talked. We knew about it. We all like. It's not like we didn't warn him, but at the same time, it's not our position yeah. to disencourage somebody to no, no, not follow his dreams. Hey, you know, outside of just the competitive sake, it's just purely out of friend sake. You want to support anybody that is willing to make this crazy, ridiculous leap into Formula Drift and invest. An ungodly amount of time, mm -hmm. money, and energy to compete. This shit is not easy, and and I'm sure we'll it's talk to Ken here in a minute. But, but to operate and run a team and to drive a new, it is a, an 80 an hour a week job during the on season and off season. It doesn't stop. And so knowing Dylan's work ethic and his ability, you can only hope that it would work in his favor because he's not going to stop because he has this drive to perform and execute his task of being a Formula Drift driver. But there's a difference between a good team and there's a difference between the bad team. The good team is you have a supportive group of guys like Ken who stuck around for a majority of the year with the GT86 and stayed with them. And guess what? It paid off. Their fucking winners are Irwindale. Not many people have done that, but that's a good team. A bad team is somebody that goes and hides and says their engine's blown up and miraculously is gone. That's a bad team. 
The good teams provide opportunities. The bad teams take opportunities. Dylan was in the chase for the rookie of the year next to Travis Reeder and the pits. Dylan, all he did was walk up to Travis Reeder on the day, and this is when we found out. He congratulated Travis Reeder saying, hey, congrats on the rookie of the year. That's the first thing that Dylan did. He wasn't pissed about it. He wasn't upset about it. He just congratulated uh, Reeder on that, and that's kind of when we found out. But there's a lot to the story that uh, we don't know. Mm-hmm. And Dylan and Pat Gooden and Alec Honadel and Turk have all uh, all decided to t- tell us their personal experiences. As each of them kind of had s- very similar, but they also had bad experience or different experiences. So once we get the full scoop, then you guys will be able to uh, g- get the full story. But that's kind of all we know, and it sucks because yeah. Dylan is our boy. We we're rooting for Dylan. We like Travis Reader too. But once again, as an a f- as a fan of drifting, right, we were robbed from witnessing a true championship race for rookie of the year. That's what was robbed from the Very spectators. Yeah. And from Dylan, he was robbed the opportunity. You only get one shot at rookie of the year, and yeah. he was robbed that. That's another thing that hurts. So it's like these are things that uh, we all missed out on because I know Dylan would have lit a fire in chasing for that rookie of the year, but it was taken away. But there's still a lot more to the story. Now, the last thing that I'm going to say about this, rather than me going on a rant, is every bad story, typically a good story comes out of it, right? Something positive will be learned from this, and we learned that. How do you burn? Retax before this was one of the only teams that flipped drivers more than underwear, right? And now you have Huddy <laughs> Racing, who took that spot. Retax is no longer around because of that, right? Huddy has kind of replaced them, and it's like you look at the trends. If you go through a driver every single year, there's an issue internally, externally. If you're a fan of the sport or you're not, that immediately raises a red flag. How long have you been with Grady for, Ken? Mm-hmm. Seven, seven, eight seven years, years now. There you go. That's a great fucking team right there. That is somebody that yeah, is right in, they are. you know what? Yeah. They're fucking great guys. Yeah. But there's people who stand behind a driver. They stand behind a team, no matter how good or how bad it is. They're going to stand behind it. When you go through three drivers in three years, that's a red flag. I think all of you guys that are watching, listening, saw that and knew that. You guys should have spoke up too. Like, whoa, why are we seeing four drivers in four years or three drivers? You just got to. Be aware of all this stuff. And I'm going through the comments, and Aaron Quillis actually says, Corey looks like a gay porn star. So I appreciate that. <laughs> totally gonna totally my, related. That's going to end, my, that's gonna end, oh. my, end my rant on that. But we're, we're, Dylan has confirmed to come on the show and talk about his experience. Yeah. Pat has talked about it, and so has Hanadel. So we're going to do a full Huddy breakdown um, but Ken, in the near future, maybe right after SEMA. Who's, who, was, who was your Huddy in your entire career? Or there was, any, any, was there any, uh, at any point a Huddy in your career? Uh, for are you, are you asking about my personal experience? Yes. Because no, all my teams that I've been with have been solid. mega great, solid dudes. You know, I started off with, you know, just a team with my dad. You know, that was a lot of fun. And I went with Rotora. I don't even, I don't know if you guys even know the company Rotora. They used to yeah make brakes. Uh, they I were my thought it was Rotora. Rotora. Yeah, Rotora. Rotora. I, I remember seeing you was like a blue or a teal uh, blue, S13. It was a blue S13. Uh, I saw Rot- that in Rotoro. a parking lot in California. I saw you drifting that, I want to say, in 2004 or five. What year was that you drove that car? 2003 and four. I was in California. Taco Ayano was in an A86. It was a parking lot in California. It was my first event I went to, and I saw Ken Gushi driving the Rotora S13. And I was a big, big boy, and you were a little, little boy. And I said, how does that little boy drive that car? I'm a big boy, and I still don't drive a car like that. And that was yeah, one of the I moments. Was like, I was like 15 or something. Yeah, dude, just sling it. Coming Damn. off the toge fresh to a parking lot in California. How, how old were you your first uh, professional event, Ken? Uh, I was 14 Jeez. when I did the D1 Grand Prix driver search. Damn. 14, I already like Dude, like, that's, it's just, like. Reminds me of, uh, you know, the, the Sorensen kids, like, you know. Well, no, actually, so James Dean was even younger, I think, when he was already doing pro competitions. Really? Huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let me see here. I'm going to look so. something up real quick. We have to look, we have to, we have to fact check you on that, Ken, but, but still, I mean, but, but you were one of the OGs. Team. You were there, you were there first. No one, no one's ever going to be the first Ken Gushi. You know what I'm you saying? You know what's funny? You know what's funny? Tell now me. that you mentioned that. So, like you said, I was one of the first, but there's a lot of firsts that I have. I was the first official Ford racing driver. You were. Nice. I was the first driver Alexis? to drive a, no, a 
front-wheel drive that was converted to a rear-wheel drive, mm -hmm. right? I was the first Japanese driver to win Formula Drift. Um, I was uh, the first was, driver. In wasn't a Dai, Dai didn't join the same, about the same time? He did, but I was the first one to win. Oh, the first, one, first Japanese driver to win. Mm -hmm. Perfect. First, um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, oh, I was the first driver ever to qualify first place. <laughs> oh, you did it, so dude. You, yeah. So first event, you qualified first. Uh, it was 2004 Road Atlanta, the very first Formula Drift event. You qualified first. Yeah. Dude, dude. that's... Wow. That's crazy, isn't it? Isn't that awesome, dude? Dude. I, I did... That's a lot of first. I mean, like that's that's so cool. Like think just, yeah, just think about it. Like do you literally have paved the road for a lot of these drivers, Brian? Oh, I think Jerry gave him the nickname like the future, Ken the future or something like that. Oh god, that was a long time ago. I'm like the present or even almost the past now, but <laughs> You don't even have a single white hair. What are you talking about? I have a lot. You guys can't see it because I can't see it on the camera. Healthy hair. Well, you have the Asian genes. It makes you look forever young. I hope so. Here, let me see. I found a picture of Ken. I don't. Hey, Brian. Do we still? Brian. Do you still? Do we still have no, the can't, technology? Can't do it right now. No. Why not? Sorry. It, it, uh, it's like the video card has been twitching, Corey. But let's move on. God, let's move on. I want to show this picture of Ken. Gucci show it on your phone. Baby. Is that me with the afro? Uh, let me see. I wish I can have a way of showing this. Hold on, let me see here. I'm gonna find it right now. Hold on one second. I'll pull it up on my phone. I'll do the cheater way. Paco, you can continue on since you're spoiling the show by not having technology I'm on the side. I'm not spoiling it. I'm keeping it safe. You're spoiling it, dude. We need we we're we're in the future, dude. We've been doing this for four years and we still can't put a picture up on the screen. Well, maybe maybe when uh, when uh, when uh, Ken Gushi becomes a show sponsor, we're gonna be able to afford that kind of technology. Man, I yeah. need money to sponsor myself. <laughs> Okay, here we go. I'm going to pull it up right now. I'm digging in. I'm digging in. Here it is right here. This is a beautiful picture of Ken, by the way. Um, let me open this here. There, here it is. Perfect. So this looks like this photo says it was taken in 2003. Look at this. Okay, here we go. Tell me if you remember this photo. Uh-oh. Here we go. Come on. My phone, this Corey, iPhone. Corey's playing oh, FR Legends now instead of. I'm, I'm drifting. I'm uh, playing, catching a Pokemon Go. It's uh, the Ken Juicymon. I right, hear it. Ken Juicymon. <laughs> so here you go. Look at this. So this is Ken early years. Look at. <laughs> oh man! Wow, that is a terrible picture of a very not. Yeah. So see, you were a Falcon definitely. Tire, Ford Mustang, Discon Tire. Um, <laughs> that looks you, a lot like the other Japanese drivers. Do, do you remember this photo? See, like in that photo, I, your, your phone turned off. In that photo, I can huh. totally see why people would confuse you with with right. uh, with Dai. Right. I, I don't know, Corey. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Can you keep? Yeah. God damn it! Sorry, oh, buddy. I, I have what? a whole album on my phone dedicated to Dai can fuck ups. Oh. Where people tag us, you know, obviously in the wrong. Tags, but hold Sam, on, let me see. Sam is not here, but while you find it, he has a story where I think you guys were at SEMA and uh -huh. he saw, I think he saw you. Uh -huh. You were going up in the escalators. He was going down and he saw you. He's like, oh, hi, Dai. And while he was going down and turning and seeing your face up close, he realized he was Gushy instead. And he just like turned pale, like while just like stepping away from you, like <laughs> realizing, like, oh my God, this is. <laughs> Yes. Up. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have it on this phone. Oh. It's a, oh, this phone. Okay, you got one. You got one for the plug, and one for your friends. Is that what it is? You have two phones. I have ten phones, all for Pokemon Go. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> See, I wish we had the technology because there's this dude in Japan who has a bicycle. Have you seen that picture? Yeah, he has, like he has twenty phones. Twenty phones around this bicycle. That is goals for sure. That is goals. So when you retire from Formula Drift, I know you, you still have a lot of life. A bicycle. I'll see you on your bicycle with 12 yeah. iPhone X's just yep. slanging Pokeballs, dude. I'll see you just swiping up on everything. <laughs> there you go. This is the ninja skills. Where's, uh, 
Speaking okay. of what, what what kind of car are you sitting on right now? Oh, this is my uh, freshly built IS300 with the 1J. Oh, that's ah. amazing. Wasn't that car at uh, at FD this weekend? Yeah, it was at the Link booth. Yes. Yes, we saw it. That uh, was my car. Dude, that car is so tight. Thank it you. It's clean. Thank you. It looked pretty. And he's got Link ECU, which, you know, proud sponsors of the show. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So what's crazy... So let me talk about Let me hear yes, it. Okay, let's talk about it, this. Because I want to I know. I want to know. I want to know. I'm old, right? You are sure. old. You're really I fucking old. old. I'm very old. 31. Oh, yeah, I'm growing white hair. I'm 33 now. <laughs> So oh, on. Like, like when I was a teenager, I was like, hell yeah, let's get the car, take out the AC. I don't need a radio. I'm a man. I'm gonna drive this drift car on the streets. I don't need windows, blah, blah, blah. Hey, you thought that was cool. Now I'm 33. Like I want full interior. I want a working AC. I want a nice radio and I want nice one Jay-Z foot to two sounds. You know, I want a nice luxurious car. So I wanted to a retain the AC when I was building this car. That was like And you still I have it? Priority. And I do. And you know why? Because <laughs> Mark Panic from Panic Wire built this amazing harness that plugs into the Link ECU. And the box was custom made and packaged by Access Manufacturing. And this whole package lets me retain the AC. So I can cruise down the street with my 1J powered IS300 with AC. No check. That's in incredible. Price. It's just crazy what technology has come to because that would have been really hard to do i mean it probably wouldn't be impossible but it would have been mega hard to do 10 years ago when i first thought about this project so i have a uh, mark panic harness in my car Ooh. oh so i work with mark i work with link but i've been wanting to build a jay-z powered street car for some time now but just like you me being an old man yes i want to see you you know what because you're bigger in size <laughs> <laughs> like you're taller, you're kind of wider. You should get a GS300. So I have an IS300. You should get a GS300. You know why? They what? made the same exact kit that's just completely plug and play for a GS300. <laughs> you can drop in a 2JZ, BBTI, 1J BBTI, whatever you want. Use the stock harness and you have AC. Gush, huh? you just told Corey he's too big for an IS300. You are. Come on, let's be real. I barely fit an IS300. If you guys have never met Corey Hosford, he's actually a giant. He's a, he's a petite man. What are you talking about? He's like maybe five... Five six, hundred and ten soaked. That's me. Oh, that, oh, damn it! We got to see. I, I've I've been cropping my body on the Ken's little body, but <laughs> it is funny. Hey, Sometimes I meet people, and it's like I've met people who've like bashed me on the internet before, and it's kind of funny because they think I'm a little tiny man, and I'm still a tiny man just in other places. But it's like <laughs> I'm I'm down to suplex if we have to suplex. Me and Gary King, you know Gary King, right? Gary's huge. Gary's another massive man, and me and Gary yeah. just had a wrestling match. Gushy, and you make him look tiny. Stop with and the, I make Gary look tiny. Stop Gary's with the body shaming, Gushy. Uh, Here, let me see if I can find. <laughs> Here, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you guys a video real quick. While you look, because for it. I just I just want to show you guys. And the thing is, is like, where were we walking around? We walk around. Somebody asked if I was your bodyguard. Actually, I, I'm. I am Ken's bodyguard. Um, is it Sema. It's probably if you're, not, if you're not his bodyguard, you're definitely his body right. double. So here, let me show you guys. This is what happens. Look at this. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is me fighting King Gary. Move, move it a little bit to the, to the right. And Gary is a massive human being. I pick up a chair and I smash him in the face with it and take him oh out. Oh my god! You completely knocked him out. Look at I that. I destroyed him and I got a three count. I took his championship belt. Dude, it's game over. Look at three count. Oh my god. Play it again. So you know, you know Gary. You know Gary, and uh, see, Ken, you're, you're really fragile because you are a fast, quick jockey. You're the jockey of the Formula Drift world. So you need some strong men around you, and that's why Gary and I uh, exist, <laughs> is to protect people like you. Thanks. I, yeah. I, really, I really thought I was like the smallest driver in FD until uh, Taguchi came in. He's tiny. He is tiny, and I actually, I first had my first interaction with Taguchi last week because on the on the burnyard on uh, the burnyard I met him for the first time yeah. I met Jerry I see Jerry pop up all over the internet and I shook Taguchi's hand and it was like this tiny soft oh little God, frail boy. hand and I was like oh, I was like shaking like my my my, ne my niece's hand oh, dude, just I so can, tiny I can wait I can wait But, for Taguchi to ninja kick the hell out of your face dude oh dude 
And but the thing is, like people like Ken and Taguchi, extremely flexible human beings. Like if I were to go down in an Asian squat, my gut rests on my knees, and then I fall over. But Ken can squat down and drop a low girl, and so does Taguchi. But uh, you know that's one thing I motivate myself to be is be just like Ken when it comes to the squat game. I can teach but, you. Uh, please, I, we can train, baby. We can train. We can do yoga. We can do whatever it needs to to get the SWAT game going on. But you're an expert <laughs> at it. Let me let, let's let's go real quick to an, uh, a few more uh, super chat questions. I've been waiting here for a while, and we yeah, have yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. we have uh, K Bob eleven twenty one Ken. Hey K Bob. Hi K Bob. Ken, in your opinion, who's the most talented driver z- drivers in Pro One? who haven't had great success, podiums or wins. And big congrats on the Irwindale win, dude. Ooh, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a tough question because there's a lot of drivers that have mad talent that have not had the opportunity to stand on the podium only because they've had uh, you know, unfortunate luck, mechanical failures. But I can honestly say 90% of the drivers can easily stand on the podium any day of the week. Um, it's just, you know, some drivers are a little bit more consistent. They have better equipment. Um, and, you know, with equipment comes the funding, so they have better funding and uh, the personnel to give them the opportunity to do so. But one person that does stand out a lot, and I'm surprised he hasn't been on the box yet, would be... Um, What's his name? Castro. Castro has had success in tandem battles. Obviously, the one that stands out the most is with uh, James Dean in his battle in Orlando a couple years ago. And if he can pull off that same energy chase run at every event, I don't see why we won't see him on that podium. Well, and let's talk about previous Formula Drift drivers. I'll tell you one driver, and I said, I think I just may have said this last show. Um, you know, with some drivers that have entered and left the series that should have stayed in. And one of my favorite drivers of all time, I want to brag about him a little bit because I'm a big fan of this dude, is Kenny Moen. He has been on the box, though. He he has, but he doesn't get the credit he deserves. The dude is such oh, a sure. monster. And you know what I mean? It's like if he was in a, like, he drove Tanner Faust's old 350Z, yeah. which was ratted out and was beat up. He hopped into Hubinet's Challenger or Charger for one or two rounds and did really good. But he has was never in like one of those like good quality built cars where the dude can definitely. Uh, yeah, he's a madman for sure. Yeah, it, absolutely nuts. Yeah. Absolutely nuts. Um, yeah, Castro. Let me think of who else that could be on the box. We're talking uh, about guys that have never been on the box, right? Or are you just talking about guys? Who... Uh, either way, just underrated, just underdogs, underrated people who. Um, who you think should be up there? Anybody it could be anything. We only see Michael Essel once this year. Ken, you're up, you, <laughs> dude. I'm just kidding. I, no, no, no. We've saw. I don't know if you ever pay attention to Instagram or read the comments, but a lot of people were one very emotional, but very positive in the comment section. Like, holy shit, why did this take so long? This dude has been an OG in the game. It just took 14 years. <laughs> To get another win. 14 yeah, dude, years. The, the support that I got this past weekend was, and it still is, overwhelming. I mean, it really shows like how much support I've had behind me all these years. And, you know, like, again, it took a little bit of time. But I was, one, super happy that I was able to, you know, showcase something to the fans, you know, my supporters, my sponsors. And two, you know, obviously provide some results for uh, my team because my team has had my back again for, you know, Mm -hmm. eight years now. And, of course, my former teammates, too, with RSR, those guys have also reached out to me congratulating me. So the support has been very overwhelming and uh, it's it's been a very nice couple days after the win. But now going back to the drivers that deserves more credit than they get – Honestly, a, a lot of drivers that don't frequently get on the box or even you know get past some of the battles deserve more credit than they should. And one of the things that I saw on um, the, the Maximum Driftcast uh, conversation on Facebook was, you know, should some drivers that frequently get into accidents or crashes right. 
get revoked of their license. And I, I got to say, I think that's kind of unfair. Yeah. Because, you know, we're, we're all <clears throat> pushing hard to be out there. And it could be any one of us that's had a bad weekend and put it. Or a bad list. year. Yeah, or a bad year. I've had many years where I felt like I shouldn't be, you know, where I was or I don't deserve the, the support or funding that I was yeah. getting because of my bad year. But, you know, Me we, too, we all... Yeah, right, Corey? You know how it is. I've had two great years, buddy. They were the best. <laughs> no, but it, it is what it is. You know what I mean? It's like you just – shit happens. You always got to go back to shit happens. And sometimes sure, it's – for Like I said, if it takes somebody 14 years to get back on the podium, it's like, yo, you go through 14 years to get that win again, it, it, it's just the 14 years of learning is all it is. Right, and when it does come, it's worth it. I, I'll tell you guys for now, it is 100% absolutely worth it. Just keep pushing – um, because that's all you could do, right? Just look forward and continue on and learn from everything you've yep. done. And one day you'll get there. And I think I was able to kind of show that in a way, or in a sense, that, um, what is it, Persever- perseverance? Is that perseverance, what Perseverance, yeah, we'll yeah. take it. Yes. Um, yeah, and that's the thing is like um, Pro 2 is a great series too. And I still think it's okay. And I, well, Let's talk about this because you, you can also elaborate on this. I think it's okay for Pro 1 guys to go back down to Pro 2 if they decide to. And they shouldn't be judged for going backwards and developing a car, developing a team, um, and using Pro 2 as a stepping stone or to relearn uh, something before they move back up. And I think there's still some Pro t- Pro 1 guys that just are too sensitive and moving back down to Pro 2, even if they want to or not. But Pro 2 is not a terrible thing to develop. You're proud not at all. No, not. I agree 100%. Um, but I thought there was, wasn't there a rule before where um, if you had, what was it, finished under a certain yeah. standing, standing, you would yep, have yep, to go down. back or something? And yep. then the top eight Pro 2 drivers kind of replace it. What happened yep. to that? Because I wasn't really. I, I think that we only have 30. Give me one second. Let me get my. Let me get I my sticks was, pulled up. Let I me log in. Is, let me log uh, into my memory bank here. Okay. Oh, you know what? I think I remember. It's uh, any any driver that finishes below 32. Let me pull down my standing. I think it's like 36. Okay. So here we go. We've had what 33 drivers in the point standing this year. So one guy gets bumped down to Pro 2. You know what I mean? It's like we don't have a full 40 car field, so it's not like we're punting anybody out. What we should do is cause the Pro 2, you know, help support the Pro 2 guys move up to make a 40 car field um, in Pro 1 if that's what we want. I, I just don't know what people want. I don't know if people want to stack Pro 1 field or if they want 32 committed drivers um, to go compete and just limit at 32. I, I I don't know. I think top 32 is fun to watch. I mean, obviously. What's that? Top 32 is still fun to watch. I mean, obviously. It's, a, it's fun to, it, dude, top 32 is equally as exciting to watch as top 16 because you have these 32 guys that are just machines yeah. out there. 32 competing. badass drivers. Yeah. yeah. You've seen there's surprises. No, there's I mean, no gimmies or there's you've, no. You've seen Vaughn, Forsberg, uh, Matt Field. You've seen them being uh, defeated on top 32 battles. I mean, Everything can yeah. happen. It's not like, oh, you know, here comes yeah, all the top Gucci 32. Yeah, Gucci and meetup, you know, in Atlanta. It's like, that's a top four of, you know, competition right there. We're still getting all you these crazy. crazy? Right. So a couple of, oh, okay. So up until a couple of years ago, I think all of us drivers or everyone would, would agree with me that the top 32 battle is one of the easier battles. And then, you know, the real battles start in the top 16. But nowadays, you got to be like 110% starting at the top 32. Yeah, because the brackets are stacked. I yeah. mean, we see we see buy runs, you know, frequently because, like you said, we don't have a full right. stacked field. But it's just there's no easy battle out of the top top thirty two nowadays. No, nope. No, even going back to like this round, you had Ken Gushi had a buy run. That was a fucking tough one for you. I almost took myself out. Dude, you almost took yourself. <laughs> yeah, was it the last outer cliff or what? The outer zone two entry, yeah. I nicked the wall and completely uh, shit in my pants. <laughs> shit, shit, shit everywhere. You had Dayo Shahar and Matt Field in top 32. You had uh, yep. you had Justin Pollock versus Federico Shrifo. You had Essa for You had Forrest Wang versus Dirk Stratton. You had James uh, James Dean versus Kevin Lawrence. Dean Kearney versus Jonathan Castro. That's you had one. you know you, you there's some stacked stacked dudes and even here let me go back around. Yeah, uh, 
Matt Field, Forrest Wing, Michael S. versus Federico Sharifo, Justin Pollock, Ryan Turek, Von Gittin um, versus Chris Forsberg. Is that Dallas? Yeah. Uh. But it's like, dude, you're getting these top four, top 16 runs early on top 32. That's why I don't know what's better. Is it better to have a 60-car field and just say, all right, everybody battle it out, or you keep the strongest of the strong and make Pro Tour work harder to move up to be a, a competitor? Or... Or you force the you know bottom twenty four down to be replaced by the I don't know. It's, it's I don't still, know. Uh, yeah, I mean I'm the probably the worst person to ask. <laughs> yeah, because you've only been in the sport since the first round, and you've been yeah. doing it for fifteen years. I just don't yeah, really know much. Probably don't have any. Oh God, goosh. Okay, so let's go here. So let's go through. Um, more. We'll, we'll wrap this up quick because I know you've been sitting in your car just huffing fumes There's for the past. A bunch of more hour, uh, so. super chat questions. Off. I'm good. Okay. The other one, super chat question from R. R. Lopez again. Ken, do you want R. R. Lopez? Do you want red velvet or chocolate Susie cakes? Ooh, red velvet Dude. has always been a favorite of mine. And I gotta mention, so you guys know Drift Kelly girl, right? Steph. Yeah, absolutely. She's been like a num- a day one fan for yep. Formula Drift and myself. Yep. And she always, always, always brings me red velvet cupcakes. Nice. Because Rock she knows star. they're my favorites. So thank you, Steph. Nice. Yeah, Steph yeah. is uh, an amazing human. Yeah, uh, R. Lopez also brought us uh, cupcakes, both chocolate and velvet, velvet this weekend. So thanks a lot, buddy. Ooh. Appreciate it. He's so R. R. Lopez. I like red velvet. He's getting us fat, man. So <laughs> be ready for some red velvet at Long Beach. Then a super chat question from Chris Nelson. Congrats on the win, Ken. Thank uh, you, Chris. Who has uh, who was a uh, more emotional on the win? You or your mom? Also, now that it's the off season, are we going to get uh, some more streams on Twitch? You're a Twitcher. Ah, are, so are Twitch you a was well. I have an account. I try to set up a whole um, system, but it's just so hard to Twitch while I'm on the VR goggles because I didn't know how to implement the chat inside the, the VR world. You need to have somebody else help you with that. Somebody reading the chat for you while you are doing mm. your VR stuff. So like a two-person Twitch. Yeah. Yeah. Tag I mean, team. I, can, I, can hire I mean, Corey. Corey is all about Maybe. the Twitch. So, and he can he can do the VR. <laughs> he almost puked in your house last time. He did. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, I almost threw up on myself. I was gonna let. I was gonna. So, let, I was. I wasn't gonna let Boba eat it either. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, going back to his question. Uh, it was it was super emotional because as soon as I completed the second run against Essa and he spun in front of me, I honestly didn't know what had happened. Um, I, I couldn't recall if I hit him or not. But as I was cruising back to the finish line where they announced the winner, I was watching the replay and I was just praying so hard, saying, please, please tell me that I didn't hit him. Because Ben, who's my spotter, yeah. Ben Schwartz, or Big Smoke, he was asking me, well, did you did you hit him or not? Did you hit him or not? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm freaking out. <laughs> and I was watching the replay, and it showed in slow motion where he just spun out. It was an isolated incident. At that moment, I just started bawling in my helmet. I was like, fuck yeah, we did it. We're winners. And I just don't remember what was going on. But I, I remember sobbing in my helmet as I was turning around to go to the winner announcement in front of the grandstands. And... Uh, in that drive, I was on my radio telling my team how amazing they were throughout that weekend. And uh, just just talking about it uh, with them was just making me more emotional. So I was like super ugly crying in the helmet. And so I stopped crying before I pulled off my helmet because I don't want, well, I don't want, I don't want to look like a mess. But uh, <laughs> I just saw everyone kind of <clears throat> running down towards me. And then I saw Lorette. Um, and then when she was asking me all these questions... Um, oh no, no, it wasn't even before that when yeah. uh, Jared was kind of just messing around, prolonging the whole announcement. So I was like, "Come on, Jared, hurry up! Like, I just want to hear <laughs> my <tell> name." <laughs> um, and when he announced announced uh, my name, I just completely lost it. Um, I was just overwhelmed with emotion. Um, and then I saw my team, and I just didn't know what was going on. Um, but I just remember Laura interviewing me, and as I was kind of stopping my emotional mess and my eyes were finally drying up drying up i saw my mom oh. uh, crying and i just completely lost it again <laughs> i just went super emotional again and it was just 
it was just crazy. It was yeah. crazy, crazy, crazy. If I could just slow down time in that 30 minutes and really see what was going on, I don't think my heart would be able to take it. But uh-huh. it was very, very important when for me um, emotionally because you know it's my first year with Achilles, um, and Sherilyn and Achilles has always wanted me on her team, and it was just a great feeling to be able to provide the win. And not just a win, too. It was a one-two finish for Achilles, Essa and I, both on top of the podium. And for my team, too, who believed in yeah. me, um, also becoming a team owner, taking on a challenge. There was just so much that happened, uh, so much that could have went wrong. Um, it just was the absolute, absolute best way to finish the season. I don't know why I have this on my finger. Sorry, guys. It's <laughs> okay. kind of distracting. But, yeah, it was just so... So much online, and uh, it was just good. so well deserved. Like, I mean, you you told us not too long ago, you know, like I know I'm not contending for the championship, but I, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna put a crazy fight, and I'm here to screw up the points. And during the halftime show, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, like the drivers and all that, and that's one of the things that I mentioned right away. I was like, well, Gush is here to party, and you know, yep. you can see him. And he's driving the way you were qualifying, the way you were practicing. It's like he's dialed. He's ready to cause some damage and put some points on the board. And and you did. And you you know you got the maximum points you could get. Well, I mean, without the qualifying, I mean, first place. You know, like it. You definitely didn't help make it and en- make it any easy for anybody to win a championship and to win this round at all. Well, yeah, if there was one spot that I could choose. Um, it would definitely be Irwindale, and uh, I did it. So massive, massive thanks to my team for even letting that happen. And, of course, the fans and my sponsors and you guys and Formula Drift. You know, it was uh, just a crazy ending to a very challenging season for me. Nice. I'll tell you, um, I, uh, I tried holding my emotions back when I saw you win and you put both of your hands over your face, I'm like, oh, he must just have a really big sneeze coming. <laughs> so he's, he's not he's, he's not sad. But then I heard Mama Gushi run up with this, this crying screech of enjoyment, and that's what did it for me. Other than that, I was like, no, I'm good, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I heard You put her on your glasses. Like, ah, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. She, 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 she pulled it out of yeah. me. She pulled it out of me. But then you got it out and climbed the fence. In a yep. in a rage of excitement, and I think that was pretty. That badass. was actually Kenji. He was super excited. He was like, "Come on, man, we gotta do it. We gotta do it." I was like, "Oh, I don't know if that's a good idea." <laughs> but uh, we did it. Um, but yeah, everyone was excited. All the fans. It was just super happy to see the fans just as excited as I was. And what made it even better was my whole family was there. My mom, my dad, obviously, my sister, even my friends. My friends that have been coming to Formula Drift, Irwindale. For more than 10 years, they were all there. Um, and to be able to show them you know, this much excitement was just a dream come true. That's great, man. Yeah, super, super, super well-deserving. I know we talk about all this amazing time, but the one thing I do want to catch up on is um, your incident in St. Louis that ended you causing your motor. What, what happened? Because that was probably, like you said, that was your low of the year was that particular incident. Yeah, so, so okay. A lot of stuff happened happened even before going to St. Louis. First of all, I didn't have a spotter uh-huh. around because Ben, Big Smoke, Schwartz uh, had to go to surgery um, last minute. And, of course, you know, health over anything else. So I was like, you dude, for sure, like, sit out this event, you know, stay home. Um, take care of your health first because that's the most important thing was that, you know, he's healthy. Um, and my boost brigade and also Pro 2 driver teammate Sean Adriano kind of sat in or t- took over Ben's job to become like a sub spotter by helping me uh, out by sending footage. So he would, you know, record my runs and kind of just text it to me and I would watch my runs while I was practicing or even during qualifying and tandem battles. So one, that was a challenge because, you know, as drivers, we rely heavily on spotters and they're essentially our eyes off the track, you know, telling us, how far away we are from the cliffs, the outer zones, um, basically giving us feedback run after run and feedback of the other drivers that are doing good or not so good. So that hurt us tremendously. Um, And B, we were short-staffed because not only has Ben a spotter, but 
he's also a mechanic, so he helps us uh, in the pits with the, the maintenance, tire changes, the setup, alignment. He's the alignment guy or the go-to guy. So um, just having him or having having that absence put a huge uh, rock on the road or, or, or a huge rock. Rock on the road, that's fine. Yeah, a huge bump on the road, sorry, uh, for us. Um, so now, okay, so the, the big incident um, was during the top 32 battle against Taguchi Kazuya. Yep. Um, the first run was where I led. And uh, you know how he is. Like, lately, he's been on fire. He's been Dude, he killed it. He qualified, like, top 10 in Irwindale. The dude uh, has been he, killing it. He's been killing it. He's been getting better every round, every run. And Jerry has that car dialed. Like he yep. has that car super dialed. So I knew it wasn't going to be an easy battle. And I knew like I had to, you know, push it one hundred percent. Like going back to no easy battle from top top thirty two. Like this was a huge example of that. Like this battle was not going to be easy. I had to give it my all and my lead. And so that's exactly what I did. But I don't know what was going on behind me because I didn't have a spotter. So when the time came to chase, I look over my phone and it just says, go hard on chase. You know, Sean said, yeah. got to go hard on chase. I'm like, ooh, okay. So that must mean he was all over my door when I was leading and I have to give it 110% uh, behind him. Uh, that's exactly what I did. Like on the first entry, that was a short run up, but on the entry, I was like right on his door. I just had to make sure he doesn't get away because his car's fast. I got right on his door, and as we were transitioning, I got a bit too aggressive, and I kind of bumped his trunk or his uh, bash bar with the front of my car, and I got on the inside. But I was, as I was doing that, his bash bar, unfortunately for me, his bash bar sits two inches higher than my bash bar, and it sliced the two fittings on mm. my oil cooler behind my bumper. And that sheared the oil cooler, and I was just spilling oil all Everywhere. over the track. In that moment so from the inside clip all the way to the outers the next two outer zones full power uh, full load and fourth gear uh, with no oil pressure um, and halfway through the second outer zone I had noticed that a warning light had come up and as soon as I saw that I, I, I knew immediately what had happened I shut it off um, right before the finish line but it was just too late like I had completely ruined the track for Formula Drift fans, so I apologize for that. I mean, it was a huge blow to the show because that happened in the top 32. It wasn't even the finals or the quarterfinals, quarterfinals, finals or anything. But like you said, that was a that was the lowest point of my year because as a team owner, I'm like, well, okay, so how do I afford this? How do I schedule Takeshi to fly in between? St. Louis and Dallas because in between I had to make a grid life appearance with that same car. Mm -hmm. So how do I schedule in a couple days extra for Takeshi to fly in? Where first of all, where even am I gonna perform the swap? Where do I ship the spare engine to? There's just so much going on right. that I was overwhelmed with challenges and yeah, like it sucked. Like it sucked for one. I ruined the show for the rest of the drivers because they had to drive over well, a messy track. But it, but it wasn't you. I mean, it was uh, something that happened well, because of your car. And that event will forever be known as the great oil spill, the, the great Gucci oil spill of 2018. But it wasn't your fault. So I know, I know because you're a good guy and you feel bad. But it wasn't your fault. Like you didn't do anything. Like you didn't even place equipment out of the ordinary area so you know like it happens this is racing but you know like you apologize obviously in a very nice and polite manner but this wasn't your fault you know like you you're you're good thanks <laughs> but yeah at the time i felt terrible i mean i felt like you know i i just wanted to hide under my blankets with boba <laughs> and just not see the world um Corey, we have a, have a couple more super chats that we have to get out of the way before we go to the Instagram questions. Hit them. Ben Tranter. NADM, Hi, who ben. replaces Andy Yen? Hmm? Do you have any idea who's going to replace Andy Yen as a judge? Ooh. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, it could be anyone. But I, I, one thing I know for sure is Formula D is doing their absolute best to make sure they don't screw this up. Yeah. So they're not going to just put anyone in there. You know, they're going to think it through. They're going to go over all their candidates, which I don't even have any clue to who it could be. But um, th- they're not going to just choose anyone yeah. to replace Andy because Andy was a huge, you know, he played a huge part to making Formula D what it is today. And he had, you know, his inputs were very crucial to kind of building the foundation of yeah. the judging criteria. And so with that said, yeah, it's, I'm, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I really but don't I th- know. I'm hoping it's someone that has prior com- competition experience that knows the ins and outs of you know, judging how hard and challenging it could be. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I honestly don't know. Then uh, we have uh, Shit for Brains. <laughs> uh, he's saying, only super tonight. Ken, when you won, I was ecstatic. Thank when you. When being interviewed, I was shedding a tear. When Lorette <laughs> choked up, I for, almost, I for real almost bawled. Not a single person deserved this more than you. Oh, gee. So, Appreciate it. Thank you so much. His name is Shit for Brains. Shit for Brains. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, the other one right here. Uh, oh, I think that was the last uh, Super Chat question. Let me see. Let me just double check because I don't want to miss anybody who's been very, very uh, uh, grateful and for giving your Generous. Super Chat questions. Which, by the way, let me real quick before we move on. For people who are... Uh, who are doing the super chat and want to support the show? There's another way you can support the show by becoming a Patreon because we have this steering wheel that we're going to give away to our Patreon. So just don't, I don't want to do it at the very end of the show because by then a lot of people's gone, but I want to just show people this Grip Royal steering wheel we're going to give away with the Maximum Driftcast steering oh, wheel by Grip nice. Royal. So, yeah, thank Gush. you guys. Goosh. We give What's, away stuff on our show. We've been doing this dumb show for almost four years, Ken. God damn. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how we've done it. Hey, you guys are doing a fantastic yeah, job. Thank so you. Four you got, years, thank you. Jesus. Yeah, you nice. you've been you've been on on studio guest in the past. We had a mega yeah, show. I, you like, know what? This is what my fourth time on the show. Is it yeah. third time? Mm-hmm. Fourth time? I think. One time a year, time. dude. You've been you're on a four year streak right now. But we do miss yeah. you inside the studio. Um, so going back to judges, I hope it's Robbie Nishida. I hope it's Take Ano. I hope it's um, June May. <sighs> June May. Oh, where has uh, he been? He's been That's serving. Like he's been serving up food at his family restaurant. Believe it or not. Oh. Okay. So we we got to go eat some uh, beef chow fun at June Mang's uh, Wangadang restaurant, dude. <laughs> That's what we should be doing. I hope it's Robbie. I think Robbie should be getting a new. Motorsports director in there, and Robbie moves to a judge. That's what we need. We need Robbie we need would be a huge addition. That would be really good for the sport. Yeah, it would be. That would be amazing. And if somebody and if uh-huh. somebody wants to challenge uh, a decision, he can just like karate chop him. Because you know Robbie, he's oh, just, he has a he has a bushido blade. He yeah, can just exactly. Slice them up. There cut, you go. Cut, cut him. Cut hey. him off. Uh-huh. Uh, Knives Nine says Alexi Noriaro. <laughs> yeah, Alexi hey, actually. <laughs> he's like, yeah, good. Job. Oh, is that what he said? <laughs> That's what he responded because, like, somebody uh, tagged him. Was like, "Yeah, who could joke?" <laughs> yeah, he's a good it, one, actually. He, he knows yeah, a lot about drifting. He yeah. does. For whatever reason, there's a, a little beefy beef going on between uh, that community. I love Alexi to death. We actually uh, play video games very often together. Um, but I, I would love to have another Twitcher involved. Yeah, I would love to have Alexi more involved in the Formula Drift community, as he is an asset to the drift community around the world. The dude is very knowledgeable. He drifted some of the largest tracks, even uh, uh, some tracks He's in Japan. Been to, no, yeah, I've been to um, Norway with him for Gat Bill. Yep. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's uh, he, and that's the thing is you got to get somebody that's juiced up, really energized about the sport, uh, but is very knowledgeable and also understands the criteria. And he's the announcer Absolutely. and judge for D one right now. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like he, he he is heavily involved, and he, like I said, we uh, we get some dubs in on Apex Legends, but. Yeah, I think those are my three picks. Honestly, um, anybody else would be would be fair, but I think those would be the strongest turnkey and go. It's a turnkey and go. Is that a new app? Yeah, turkey and go. It's a Thanksgiving Tur- dinner. Turkey and go. 
Nice. Yep. <laughs> All right, do you guys? Uh, let's hit some uh, Graham Quesh. Let's Gucci. get Gucci in his house and tucked in for bed with yeah, Boba. You look tired. You need to. I'm not tired. I, I, you know, people always ask me if I'm tired, drunk, or high. I'm, I'm neither of those. That's not true. Thanks. <laughs> You're drunk and high most of the time. We've known that. <laughs> but not tired. You're never tired. Yeah. True. All right. Let's let's get Gucci some questions. Gucci, you have the Instagram open. He doesn't so need it open. We're just going to read them. Because you can read them for uh, you, but I mean, if you want to read them as well, you see one that you like, I mean, feel free. I'll just say, I'll just say one right now. This is from Macho Man Randy Sanchez. He's a beast. He goes, would you rather fart fire or snort Vicks Vapor Rub? Wow. I would snort Vicks Vapor Rub for sure. I, I mean, I've been doing it for like the last hour, haven't I? <laughs> oh, yeah, just the snorting. That's that Thai stuff right there. Good job, Macho. And the other thing is, is you fart fire after you have a delicious Mexican meal or Muay Thai, Mo, Mo, Thai food, Thai Thai. <laughs> Muay Thai. Muay Thai, Thai food. Great yeah. question. I love yeah. when we start them out strong yeah. like this, guys. This is Here's another very strong one right here. Second question from username Kang Wushi. He's asking, woohoo. Wait, that's you. Oh, that's me. Ah, damn it. This, there goes my strong question. Well, here's one sub and dub. This is... It, it's subdubbing. We need to talk about this too. We'll we'll have a full Irwindale breakdown because as you can imagine, Ken Gushi, the juice, the juice box. Um, there was a lot of controversial runs, and the biggest one was Forrest Wang versus James Dean. I don't know if you had spent much time analyzing or looking at that run, but if you haven't, you should just take a sneak peek at it because it's a very interesting run. But the question is this from Subdubbin: Do you think proximity should outweigh the angle score in the chase position? Do you think proximity should outweigh the angle score in the chase position? So this has been a very, very touchy, not not the battle I'm saying, but the, the judging of this has been very, I guess in a way, uh, well explained in the past. And I don't know what happened because they haven't really been discussing this, but before I think it was last year, they made a chart that kind of described, you know, what were the advantages and disadvantage of maintaining angle, but with a little bit of distance or maintaining proximity with less angle. And some of it was kind of even to others. Like, for example, this, do you guys see my hands? Yeah. Yep. This was almost equivalent to this. Yeah. So... I, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a judge, and that's one of those. Th that battle is one of those battles where I would very much hate to be in their shoes because, you know, it's like which is harder to do is is this harder to do or is this harder to do? Like, I think I I I'm, visually I'm... for me visually mm -hmm. proximity wins every time, but. Well, this is not a tandem. Yeah, I think I, th no. just... I think the fans, the fans are already, uh, how do you say, like catching up, or like they definitely uh, like be, like next to each other, um, like this, more than this, because that was definitely. It's it seems like like the fans know that it's very easy to be shallow and be have proximity, but it's not easy to be door to door. With proximity, and I think that's what the what the fans need to need to want to watch, what we want to watch, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed urgently for next. I think next um, year. I think that the the one thing that they need to do very clear is to. I mean, they were doing it at Irwindale, especially after that run, but they need to continue to make it easier for the fans to understand why they made a certain call, whether it's right or wrong. They just need to explain their decision. Um, by sort of going over the rules and using the rules as a tool to justify their decision making, I think they need to do that a little bit. Well, they they more did. Like that's that's the thing. Like they did when they, for example, like in the case of uh, James Dean versus Forrest Wang, they did explain why they gave the win to Wang after two one more times. And the the thing is that the rules do allow that. So in my in my opinion, it is the rule that needs to be changed because I think a driver who's chasing shallow needs to be penalized. So, the, the, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, sure, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So that it seems like uh, this, it's just a small tweak in the rules that will make for a better show. 
because as long that's as drivers right. are allowed to to follow very shallow and that's not that's okay then the judging is going to be kind of you know like it's going to be that good because everybody's going to be like dude the, the lead driver was killing it and the guy behind the, the, him uh, Corey? i, I want to give a, a suggestion on a judge again and uh, with idc being kind of weird i think kieran hines would be a great judge for um for formula drift just saying kieran mm -hmm. hines idc judge he is like a replica of ryan lontane but he's I think they said he's the longest known judge uh, that's been around. But the Kieran thing, Hines, the thing, and he does a very great yeah. job in explanation. I think the only problem with uh, having somebody like him come on is the judging criteria might be a little bit different. No, but that's that's the thing. I mean, because it doesn't matter who you put as judge, you can get a whole an entire new an entire new um, lineup of judges. They still have to follow the judging criteria. Well, that's fine. But yeah. the thing is, when you take somebody that's been that has watched thousands of rounds of drifting and thousands of battles, they're going to have a much better perspective of somebody that has not watched well, a thousand rounds. But on, and I on, think that's, but their perspective is going to be used to the rules that they no, have. They would just have to change the rules. They would just have to change the rules mentally, rather than looking at speed. Okay, I now know. we're looking at lane and but idle. That's, that's very that's easy to change. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. what, what needs to so, change but, is the rules, not I'm, necessarily the judges. But, I, but now, what I'm saying is. It's easier to take somebody who has judged thousands of runs rather than somebody that's been intermittently in and out of the oh, sport. Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. That's why I suggested Kieran Hines. So, yes, you'll have to do a very slight change in the way he judges to fit the yeah. formula of criteria, but that's much easier to fix yeah. than somebody that's been intermittently in and out of the sport. Yeah. We would need somebody like that. See, with Robbie Nishida, who's competed in the sport for quite some time, who has now been at every single round of Formula Drift, since he got into it when he was years ago, he's seen a lot of battles, and we need somebody like that to, yeah. uh, to 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 make that judging criteria. But those people, once again, now those people would also have a better suggestion on what's more important: is it the proximity or angle? What which one is it? That's when you need an expert to come in. That's what, yeah. and, and that's why we need that other judge to be a, a very strong suited person. Yeah. So I mean I th I think I personally think that proximity without angle is just not as exciting as proximity with angle. Like I think they're both no, of course they're both course. you know like need to be gauged and measured. So right, but who is to determine this is better than this? Right, there has to be some sort of measurement that's gonna say. I think I think it's on the rules. It's on this. the rules. The rule says the chase driver needs to imitate what the lead driver has been doing. So if the lead driver is doing this, the chase driver needs to be doing that. But it's, it's not, but it's oh, not, but it's not that proximity. specific. It's not that specific. It, 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 it's not that specific. It says, you know, mimicking what the lead driver is doing. Is it, and that's mimicking the line or doing the best, but also, yes, it's supposed to be chasing it. That, technically, James Dean was chasing, but wasn't the chasing with the same attitude that Forrest was leading. Yeah. So I think, once again, going back to the rules and writing the rules, maybe they need to be more specific exactly. on it. Exactly. It's, 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 that's my point. They just need to be tweaked, like kind of like rewritten, just to make more clear. So not necessarily change, just like address the little things so everybody can understand everything without having to need an interpretation. So our, our dear friend Megan Russell, who's an amazing human being that has helped me out a lot, former PSI, she says, DOS implemented plus judging. And Gucci, no you, Gucci no. is saying no DOS. <laughs> I, no and DOS. I'm, I'm cool with that. This is somebody – and the reason I, uh, I kind of agree with Gucci is he's experienced it. He's seen it. You see people like Forsberg and other drivers go experience in the DOS system, and it changes the game. And I'll tell you the one thing I don't like about DOS, and this is my perspective in chat. You can tell me that I'm a nutcase. Forsberg came back from China, and there's actually an event going on in China right now. I know. Um, Forsberg says the cars are wound up so tight that speed is a, such a huge impact on the DOS system that even if you're offline in the slightest way, the speed of the cars is also what's going to outweigh more than anything else. So the cars are so wound up, which affects the show because that's what the computer wants to see. So now you're adapting and tuning the cars to what the computer wants to display when visually it's not the most amazing thing. So when Forsberg just came back from China, he's like, yo, this DOS system's a bitch because we have a car <laughs> so wound up to go as fast as they can. It affects me chasing because they're so fucking fast. And that guy's literally in front of me is driving straight, but the guy in front of him that's driving straight and fast got 104 points. Yeah. 
Yeah, the problem with with uh with when you add like uh, technology, it's that if you want this technology to be extremely reliable and precise, it gets very very expensive. So when it comes to when it comes to the point of like making sure that whatever measuring device you're putting on a car is gonna be 100% accurate and fair, and it's not gonna be you know, like messed up by a jolt or by, you know, like something that happened, it, it gets very, very expensive. And I think my, that uh -huh. my my suggestion is if, if we want data, we got to collect very hard data, which is throttle position and brake position. I think that's mm -hmm. going to be the most two crucial pieces of data outside of DOS and an onboard live camera. I was going to say, yes. like even like a camera on the pedals, that would be that would be great. Yes, and then that, that's it. All you would need is just data off throttle position and brake position, which would solve a lot of issues with people crashing or in decel yeah. zones. A lot of decisions have been, you know, thrown away based based on tire smoke. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it looks like the driver's deselling an acceleration because there had been a, a slight plume of smoke that just seemed like it was an e-brake grab or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of swaying decisions in that. Where if when it's like, yo, let's get some live data or live feedback of where the drive and which is it could be doable it just takes a little bit of time a little bit of research and i say it like it sounds easy but it, it could be done if for and i i'm going to compare it to formula one but when we could get a full data analysis of a formula one car driving around the nurburgring or 14 miles and it's collecting every piece of data and displaying it on a live stream we can hopefully get gas and brake yeah. you know what i mean it's like i hope we can get just two pieces of information within a quarter mile range of where we're at yeah but I say that's probably the two more, most crucial pieces of data that we yeah. should have for sure. Uh, we have more questions because, I mean, we, we're going to have another episode where we're going to talk about the whole thing about Erwindale and hopefully we'll have the judges with us so we can actually talk more clear about all that. But in the meanwhile, question from I shot that Aaron Osebi, one of our one of our buddies. Uh, oh, Aaron. Aaron. He's asking a legit question for Gushi. How many years have you been using this particular chassis, and are you looking to build something new in the off season? The, you are a Toyota Toyota driver, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you I'm were, officially you were, part of Toyota Racing. You were drifting uh, Toyota Avalon front wheel drive car, and you're drifting like it's no big deal. Uh, the Avalon was a yeah, it's a special project with a <laughs> TRD. So they released a TRD version of the Avalon this year. And to kind of help promote that, they wanted me to drift the front-wheel drive Avalon TRD at Road Atlanta. So uh, after or in between some of my practice practice runs this year, earlier this year, uh, I went to the backside or turn, I think it was turn five, six, seven. Um, and we were, yeah, we were just putting the car sideways uh, throughout some of the corners. But that was actually a really fun project. And believe it or not, the new Avalon is actually really sporty. And it's funny to even put the word sporty and Avalon together because that's really not what you expect out of, you know, a car that you would picture an old grandpa or grandma driving to pick up groceries. But anyway, going back to the, the question, yeah. uh, this specific platform was released in 2012 and I've been driving a FRS or 86 since. So what, that's seven years now in the same platform? Um, and going into next year, I mean, we're still in talks and I really hope something does come up soon, but um, I don't know yet. I mean, the car is so developed now that I don't really want to change too much of what I'm doing because, you know, a, a win is a, a win at a round shows how competitive the car can be. And I think our car is pretty, co pretty competitive now. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, at this point, it's still in the air. A lot of it will be decided by SEMA, which is in a couple of weeks. But as of right now, I don't know yet. Corey, I mean, yeah. I hope, I hope so that this is this, so. this is a little off topic. This is from Yo It's Nato. He says Korean barbecue or all you can eat sushi, ABGs or boba, eight Korean, six or BRZs. Okay, Korean barbecue over sushi because I'm really not a big fan of sushi. And those who know me know that I never suggest sushi. Me ever. neither. I, I don't. I don't eat sushi. <laughs> ABG Fun fact. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yep. ABG or Boba? Are you asking me about Asian baby girls and my dog Boba, or <laughs> uh, probably that? <laughs> Which one would you put, Asian baby girls or Boba? Boba, my dog for sure. Okay, good. Too many Asian eight, baby si girls are on here. eight six or BRZ? Can't 
Ken, eight six or beer? Hello? I mean, I'm come on, obviously. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, BRZ, six. get out of here, get out of here, die, <laughs> trash man. We are eight six people here. Come on. <laughs> um, let me see. I got, I got another one. I got another one. Uh, uh, Give me the uh, funny ones. Let's see. The okay, you want the funny one? Okay, good, because I have a bunch of funny ones. Um, how many? This is from Smiling Bastards. How many chickens would it take to kill an elephant? <laughs> <laughs> one. All you gotta do is swallow the bone. Oh, <laughs> cool. calm down. <laughs> one chicken to kill an elephant. So that one chicken can take out a massive elephant if it just swallows the bone. Yeah. <laughs> that's. Am that's I how right you, or am I right? No, you're no, right. No, I'm just. 100%. I'm just now I just know how you killed so many elephants. It gishy makes gang, sense. Gishy gang, gishy gang, gishy gang. Gushy just killing, just <laughs> eating the elephant's bone off in the, in the middle of the safari. <laughs> You kill. How many That's elephants a, have you killed? Dude, Gucci sucked the bone off of many elephants before. <laughs> I've seen it. Dude, they, that's why it's like elephants are going extinct. If you go by Gucci's house. <laughs> is that a mic in front of you? Or is yeah, that... dude. It's, that's oh, a microphone. Oh, oh, my God. So, dude, dude, welcome to the studio, baby. This is professional, is Gucci. Sorry, you're a professional Jeff car driver. We're amateur journalists. So, dude, come uh, on. We're trying to up our game here. I have an, I have we another... got a green screen. We got a big microphone. I got a headset on. Come on, dude. I have another ser very, very serious question for, for Gucci from Chris Carlton86. Can Gucci, can you be my daddy? <laughs> he's getting, he's turning red. To. Look at he blushes. He gets look at he's nervous because he starts fiddling. When Gucci gets right. nervous, he starts fiddling. I guess like, that's a guys. yes. So when you guys walk up to Ken Gucci at Formula Drift, just Don't say really nice. Oh. Call him daddy and give him a hug and say really nice things to him because his eyes get smaller and he turns bright red. Ken, <laughs> Ken Daddy Gucci. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Right, um, here's one. Low 97 SS. He goes, what do you want to be when you grow up? Am I not growing up yet? I mean, no. Nope. I want to I be a fighter pilot and a comedian and a, actually my a my comedian? dream my dream was to become a nba basketball player and wow. if that didn't work out a turntable dj you know like wiki 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 you you just picked all the most difficult professions to get into so <laughs> you're probably better off just being a race car driver okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> here, here's another one um this is from Euro JZX. If you can eat ramen for the rest of your life, what flavor would you pick? Curry. Curry? <laughs> curry ramen. Curry ramen, mm. that's your go-to? Because I would eat curry rice for the rest of my life. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love curry. Yellow or red or, or green or brown. Curry. Are you asking what my favorite color is? Or? Yeah, your favorite yeah. curry. Oh, oh, favorite curry. Uh, Japanese curry. Oh, which which yeah. color is that one? Just or, yellow. It's brown. Brown. Oh, no, no, Corey, you I nailed it. About, <laughs> I thought he was talking about Steph Curry, the basketball player. And just, oh no. Um, this is a great question. This is the eighty-eight Trans Am. He goes, "What felt better, the first win or the last win?" Dude, that's a solid Ooh, one. That's a solid one. one. Yeah. Okay. So the first win was special, but the last win was very special because now that I'm older, I I I understand. Or okay, so. A, I'm older now. B, I'm also a team owner now, so I know what goes down and what needs to happen in order to make for a successful event. And not just winning an event, but even you know making it through qualifying or even appearing at the venue. Like I know what it takes, how much manpower it takes, how many hours, dollars, um, just the whole operation, the effort it takes to make it happen. So this last win, I was able to kind of feel all that and really <laughs> understand what it takes to get the car on top of the podium and to have guys like you know ben takeshi billy may yeah. sean on my team or you know cory taco yeah. <laughs> really really made this win special for me because i just know i just know what it takes uh to get the car on the podium and at that to win an event is just crazy yeah. The second part of that is because now that the sport has, you know, established itself as, you know, the premier series of drifting. Someone's doing burnouts. Oh. Here. 
Anyway, <laughs> now that we have established drivers, you know, championship drivers like James Dean, Frederick Osbo, Forsberg, mm-hmm. we have all these guys that are true champions of the sport. You know, they're they're good drivers, and to win in a pool of so much talent just makes it that much more special. So, definitely, definitely, this last win over the first win. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible. That's it's well said. I, I think the first one always has a moment in your heart, but when you have to work harder, bleed for it a little bit more, it makes it a little bit sweeter. Um, here's another one. This is from Drift Dreams. Would you rather fight a hundred hot dog size Corey Hosfords or one horse size hot dog? Oof. <laughs> He's confused. Uh, uh, just, imagine, just imagine a hundred little hot dogs running chilies. Uh, Come on, Ken. Come on, put a big man. I'm going to kick your ass. I'm going to kick your fucking ass. 100 hot dog sized Corey Hosfords, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would fight that. Oh, you would, huh? Yeah, just yeah, eat them all. You're in, you're in for a hurting because you don't know what I'm capable of when there's 100 of me. <laughs> or what? One horse sized Corey? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hot dog. One, one horse sized hot dog. Oh, I would. Yeah, I would fight the horse-sized hot dog because what kind of hot would dog? You? Hot the dog. Well, no, well, knowing that you can kill an elephant by biting on its bone, I can't imagine what you do to one <laughs> horse-sized hot dog. You'd probably eat the whole bone. I know you would. Yeah. Uh, there's a little, little dirty dog, <laughs> Gucci the bone eater, dude. Super Just chat. Some- Super chat question from Alex Pack. Build an yeah, IS three hundred. Alex, he's sitting in an IS three hundred right now. Look at him. How confident yeah, look at nice And look at that beautiful man. Hold on. Show us that beautiful man hanging out watching you like an overlord. Oh. That guy? This guy. Oh, my God. That guy's just arms <laughs> crossed, <laughs> hair's cut. Jesus Christ. What a stud that man is. Wow. Is he your bodyguard? You know what's funny? So I leave my garage open um, a lot of times. Yeah. And uh, my neighbors obviously drive by while I'm working on my yeah. IS-300 or something. And while I'm away on a different corner, like say I'm doing my laundry on the right corner, yep. I'll hear a car drive by and I look over trying to wave at them, but I find them waving at my cardboard <laughs> instead of me. And then they freak out, like, oh, that's not him. Hey, Ken. And hey, Ken. I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm right here. I mean, what, what kind of weirdo <sighs> keeps his own <sighs> silhouette inside his garage? That's, that's your uh, theft the, the, the terrain right. right there. That's my right, anti, I, yeah, anti-robbery here, device. Here's here's my last question for Ken, just because I love this man so much, and he's such a beautiful human being, and his mom is amazing. I, I told Ken before the show, his mom Thanks. offered me to go to dinner with her, and I, I plan on taking her to dinner. Because yeah, she amazing. loves you. She Aww. is such an amazing human being, and like I said, I didn't cry when you cried. I'm strong enough to get through that, but when I saw your mom get emotional, I was like, no, this is okay. not happening right now. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm let it go. Uh, you guys but, hear me. Um, but this is my last question for you. What's... um. Do you see a Supra in the future? I sure hope so. I mean, I'm definitely keeping my eyes, I mean, my eyes crossed, my <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I sure hope so. I mean, my car right now is very tired. Um, whether it was going to be a Supra or not, I was planning on building another car anyways. Um, okay. But I was planning on building an 8.6 only because I have so much data with it. Just We're very freshie. confident with it. Um I have a lot of as, as much as I would love to say, this is my two perspectives, I'm going to say that because I can. My two perspectives on is I'd love to see the Ken Gushi come back with a vengeance, familiar chassis, and, you know, revitalized. But I would also like to see Ken Gushi with the to- an extra little squeeze of Toyota support with the Supra and putting a lot more energy into you and your program. So that's the two sides I want to see. I want to see Gushi come back either in a car he loves and knows very well, or Gushi get a stronger Toyota support and have him in a Supra. And they stand by you for another few years. Thanks. Yep. Uh, I mean, to, to their defense, Toyota support has <laughs> been tremendous. Um, yes. And, you know, they, they're they always catering to us drivers and they're always taking care of us. And, and actually, this year I've been pretty busy compared or relatively busy compared to the other years with a lot of the Toyota appearances. I don't know if you guys keep up with my Instagram and stories, but yeah, yeah. they fly me everywhere to do appearances, talk yep. shows. And uh, they keep me in the loop of the whole Toyota umbrella, not just with racing, right. but, you know, obviously with the Avalon project that I was talking about earlier, um, the new Supra. Uh, we did a TV show, not a TV show, but a commercial ad spot with uh, Ryan Turk, Frederick Cosbo, and I at um, the balcony filming with the new Supra. I've done 
photo shoots with the new Hakone 86 with Larry Chan. So yeah, I've been <laughs> very involved with Toyota, but right. um, the other guys have also been just as involved uh, with Toyota and Toyota Racing. So yeah, their support has been tremendous. <laughs> Obviously, with any form of support, you know, more would be better. You right. know? But, uh, um, but yeah. I just want, I want to break it to you, Ken. I don't fit in a new Super very well. <laughs> I'm sorry to break it to you, but not- hey, like I said, Link has a new package with the ECU for a GS300. So if you want to build a car, GS300 would be the do- one for you. I'm gonna do it. Yeah, the Super. I love the new Super, but I look like a little. Uh, uh, <laughs> I look like a. What, how would what would I compare this to? I, I I was crammed in there like a hot dog in a little tiny <laughs> bun, and I was sweating, and I had to get somebody pull me out. I was just I was very tuckered in, and you- I know if I got. I would have been safe. I've been you're, really safe. You're probably a hot dog in a Hawaiian bread, right? Oh, for sure. Oh. It was like hanging out of both sides. You know, the bread will cover the <laughs> middle piece of the hot dog, but the ends are sticking out <laughs> like, like that much on both sides. The thing was, it's just it's a little it's a little it's a little too short for me. Like once I got it in the seat, felt good. It is a small car, but if you're you know six four six five, uh, you probably should be in a GS three hundred or driving a convertible E thirty, so you can have the top down and have your head sticking out the roof. Um, but, uh, but for you, you you fit in that thing like a, like a, you know, you, when I see you sitting in that thing, you know, that little, during Christmas time, you see Jesus in that little bird nest. I look at you and I see a little Jesus in a bird nest. And, uh, so hopefully we'll see you in a, um, in Thank a you. super next year. I hope but, so too. Awesome. Um, I don't want to cut the short, Kim, but I know it's uh, you're you have hungry. To go to bed. You have a dog inside. Mm-hmm. You have a you have a set of courses to chase after. Yeah, yeah. Um, you got a new car to build. You have an IS three hundred. You need to wash tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we want to thank you and congratulate you on behalf of all of us, including hey, uh, thank you so community. much. And also, and also anybody uh, anybody you want to thank, and you know, obviously, do you have more time now to? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, first of all, thank you guys for even letting me be a part of this show and giving me a platform to kind of speak about, you know, what's been going on, um, all the controversy, controversies, 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 controversial. Anytime, if like if for any time you whatever reason you want to just come up and like speak your mind, just let us know. We'll we'll put you in, in, you, you know, like just anytime. Oh, and by yeah. the way, the cool thing about our show too, Ken, is you can say like things like balls, yeah. taint, boobies, <laughs> armpits, and nobody's here to censor you. So you know you have you have a safe spot. But yeah. uh, I like boobies. Yeah, I know yeah. you do. You son of a gun. That's why you squeeze mine every time you see me. Uh, but anyways, guys, let's give a shout out to Ken Gushi, you guys. Uh, let him finish. Let him so finish. Thank uh, show. whoever he wanted to thank. Everybody. Yeah, well, yeah, you guys, everybody, all my fans. Yep. Yep. Um, seriously, the support this weekend has been very overwhelming, and even today, you know, five days later, I'm still getting messages. So yep. thank you guys, you know, my parents, my fans, my friends, uh, my team, my yeah, sponsors, dude. everyone that's been involved. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. You guys are really what makes drifting special, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Well, awesome. we'll see you at SEMA, buddy. Hopefully, you're yep. out there, and then uh, we'll be catching up with whatever new car you're building. But have a good night. Tell everybody we said hi, and then uh, tell Mama we'll Gucci do. we'll have dinner soon. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night, buddy. Farewell, buddy. See you guys at SEMA. See, see you, dude. Mushy mush. Konnichiwa. Arigato. Bye. Oh, yes, Bye-bye. 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 Paco, hang up on this oh man. My God. Let, let, him, let him hang. Like his... No, he's not going to hang up. The, the, the Japanese cultures are the last ones that always hang up. Oh, Come on. That's right. All right. Look, uh, he's not leaping seas. Brian, oh my God. Brian, hang, I'm hang on him. Overwhelmed. I'm gushy overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. He looks like Mr. Mime the Pokemon. Oh, there oh he my is God. finally gone. Oh, dude, I I oh. I kind of wish he wasn't. He he didn't leave. He was he was starting to get even more kawaii. For those I'm, already cry- I'm crying that he's gone again, dude. Dude, I, I'm glad you're wearing your blue blockers. Apparently, they're also like tier uh, tier blockers. You no, know, they're de- they're tier blockers. I was super emotional when Ken called earlier, and uh, I just gotta hide my uh, my emotions, dude. Yeah. I hide behind blankets and emotions, and uh, Ken brought them out of me. Oh, well, that's cute, yeah. Corey. You know what? What we have? Um, so we're gonna. You know, obviously, thank our our sponsors, but we gotta do something we haven't done in a little while because, you uh, you know, just on on today's episode, we had a lot of people join our Patreon. 
during the episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to go and give him a shout out right now. Thanks, uh, Andre Nemstov. Thank you for joining our Ooh. Patreon. Getting a chance to win uh, Grip Royal Maximum Driftcast Steering Wheel. Also, awesome. Shit for brains. Shit for brains. Actually, hey! apparently has more legend, more oh. more brains than shit, and he just joined the Patreon. Thanks a lot, um, Chris Nelson. Thank you, Chris Nelson. He also joined our Patreon during the show, and uh, Connor Minto, who also just joined recently, and finally, uh, Ben Vanderberg, who also just show <clears throat> all of you guys depending on what your patreon how much are you are uh, supporting the our patreon it gives you like if it's one dollar you get one chance one ticket for the raffle for the giveaway yeah. for the steering wheel if you have if you're doing five dollars you get five tickets so you know the more you give the more we bend no wait no that's yeah. not how it goes right Corey? <laughs> yeah when, and and the thing is we have hang and charl uh through uh our uh youtube chat or super chat. yeah oh yeah the dude guys in the super chat have been going i mean awesome we lost yeah we don't can't hear you Corey. i'm sorry mm -mm. Uh, oh there you go whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, whoa, <laughs> hanging chat with the donos, hanging chat with the donos. You come and you make it rain, and I take off my clothes. You come and make it rain, and I'll show you my holes. Oh, thank you. That was there very. That was beautiful, Corey. Good job. Did you like that? that was for yeah, uh, hanging nice, Chad. Nice serenade. Uh, I usually I usually don't s make it rain and then I show you my holes. Usually it's a lot more <laughs> PG than that. But the super chat has been crazy tonight. Yeah. So I yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys. So, so thanks to all all our patrons. Our uh, list is pretty big. Uh, we we'll, one of these days. Well, I mean, we we actually pretty <clears throat> pretty soon we're gonna have a another Patreon special episode. So. But in the meanwhile, thank you all for for being our patron support on the show. It's because of you guys uh, that this show exists. Because otherwise, Corey wouldn't have enough money to buy his blue blockers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And by the way, guys, it's like uh, I'm building <clears throat> another S14 right now. <sighs> uh, I uh, I'm doing a bunch of stuff. So obviously, we'll be showing what we're doing um, with all our new builds and projects. Pod Paco's building a C3. Sam's not building shit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we got a bunch of cool stuff coming on. We'll be at SEMA for sure. I'll be there all week doing the Hoonigan Burnyard. So if you're at SEMA, make sure you come outside and say what's up. Um, as we're going to be doing burnouts out there, I'm going to be taking the Boss 14 out to SEMA. Um, guys, a lot of shit's going on. Yeah. Corey, your, your microphone is... Uh, no, I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> but in the meanwhile... Uh, let's thank our patron. I mean, on our patron, our sponsor. So let's start with uh, Link ECU because Link ECU has uh, been supporting the show. Awesome people. Uh, Corey has Link ECU in his in his car. Um, I have a Link ECU that I'm like he's still singing. He doesn't know he can we can hear him. <laughs> but um, yeah, so they, uh, we get Link ECU on the Corvette as well. <clears throat> uh, I also want to thank Grid Life. Because great life being a supporter of the show all year, and uh, it took us to all the events. If you guys haven't been to a great life event, you have to be there. And if you're going to Vegas for SEMA, we're going to be at the great life game night. So you guys better be there for great life game night. And finally, uh, oh, uh, looks like you're back, Corey. No. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, just sometimes, like, it's like your Can voice. You there you go. I think you were trying to sing during during the whole sponsors, but he didn't. He couldn't hear you, so that's fine. Let me let me try something real quick. Can, Go for it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me when I turn yes. my voice changer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just like for a second. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, can you hear me, Paco? Yeah. Can you hear me sing about Link? Yeah, go for it. Can you hear me sing about a Patreon? That, that's right. 
Amen, brother. Me sing about AM and AM and it's like it's like I just got out of church. Oh, we got to thank everybody. We got to thank our Patreon. <laughs> All right, Corey, send us, say good night with your beautiful voice. We are going to send you up into the abyss of the internet. We got the Ken Gushi with the juicy booty. We got the Pakori Bara with the Lucy Goosey. Oh.